All right, Mayor, like 30 seconds to go live. I'm going to start spinning up the uh, stream. Okay, sounds exciting. <laughs> I was looking for this article. Can find it? Let's do that. Yeah. Perfect. Glenn? Yeah. How come um, every time somebody shares a screen, it totally takes over my computer and I can't do the other work I'm doing? <laughs> it's just the only work you should be doing. <laughs> no, I'm not, we haven't started yet. I'm writing an email and I keep getting like taken off my work here. What that, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> you hit escape, it'll go into like a windowed mode. Yeah, I would think so. Finally, there it worked. It didn't work after three, I guess four is the number of times I need to hit escape. Okay, cool. Awesome. <laughs> Glenn, let us know we're ready. We're live, whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Malinowski, Malinowski rather, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the July 8th, 2020 Township Committee meeting. Greetings from Town Hall. This is Mayor Frank McGeehy. We will now salute the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, Republic of which it stands, which stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible. indivisible. And liberty and justice for all. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment of silence for Jacob Weber, who is the who was the father of our police chief, fire chief, um, Michael Weber. Uh, Jacob was a um, resident of South Orange and. The Weber family has been in the Mapsville community for a very long time. So again, I would like to have a moment of silence for, silence for Jacob Weber, who uh, was the father to Fire Chief Michael Weber. Thank you. Pursuant to Section 5, Chapter 231, Public Laws of 1975, this is to state, this is to, this is to state for the record, the adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the public by posting and maintaining the annual notice of regular meetings on the bulletin board of the municipal building. By mailing the annual notice to regular meetings for 2020 to the news record and Star Ledger in December 2019, and by filing said notice in the office of the township clerk. Thanks. Here. 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 The act of participation of the public in any meeting, and whereas it is not the governing body to comply with the provisions of this act, same time to conduct its business in an orderly and expeditious manner, shall therefore be resolved by the Township Committee, Township Maplewood, thus hereby prohibit except to set forth in the formal agenda act of participation in the deliberations of the governing body by the public, except as otherwise described by law, thus on the public the observation, the actions, and discussions of the governing body. At all regular special meetings. So moved. Second. Sadness. Yes. Mr. Jackson. Yes. Mr. Duluka. Yes. Mr. Lembrick. Yes. 
Mary Yes, and thank you, Ms. Kristen. Good evening again. I'm going to go through the agenda, which uh, now we are leveraging our technology, which will be in front of those who are watching. Uh, we'll first start with a, a resolution uh, on the occasion of the retirement of Mr. Robert Thompson. We'll have our first public comment, agenda items only. Then we will have our annual or monthly board of health meeting. And then we will have uh, our 2020 municipal budget uh, process. As you know, we talked about the budget at the last meeting will actually be the formal process. So uh, we'll read the budget by title, have the hearing and close the hearing, and then have the adoption through resolution 161-20. Trying to move it forward here with the technology. Uh, we do have one um, introduction of a new ordinance. Uh, this ordinance is on uh, uh, occupancy of residential areas. So we'll go through that ordinance. And then after that, we'll have reports from our departments. Um, then we'll have our administrative reports. Uh, Mr. Veros is not here. So we will have um, uh, Mr. Malinowski uh, do that report. Uh, then we'll have our report from uh, Mr. Desiderio, our attorney, and from Ms. Fritzen, our township clerk. Uh, we'll then hear from the, our elected officials. And then we have one discussion item, which is the removal of potential removal of the Christopher Columbus Monument in Memorial Park. Uh, our consent agenda has a total of uh, 16 items, and I'll go through them very quickly. We have a purchase of uh, two hybrids for our police department approval to submit the grant application uh, for the Jersey D Department of Transportation to renovate Jacoby and 44th Street. Bills and claims. Uh, we will also do some hiring, uh, seasonal professional staff for the um, Community Service Department, basically for our pool. Uh, we have roadway improvements. Uh, the authorization for changing orders one, two, three, and four for our 2019 Capital Roadway Improvement Program. We'll authorize the payment uh, to Cody Computer Services. Uh, we have a special item regarding revenue and, and appropriation for the municipal budget. Uh, we will also uh, have an authorization of our summer 2020 breakfast and lunch program, which I actually visited this morning and more on that. Uh, we have a special item which of revenue and appropriation, again, for the uh, municipal budget related to COVID-19. Uh, and then we have also authorization payment to Parks Mason Worker uh, Marcus Alvaro. Um, we also have on the agenda two a uh, authorizing contract for uh, Hendrix Appraisal Company. Uh, there is no closed session. There hasn't been one for some time, so we will approve basically nothing. And that will be the end of our consent agenda. We'll move into our second public comment on any subject matter, and then we will adjourn. So that is our agenda for this evening, um, and we will first start off uh, with Resolution number 153-20, and uh, we'll go from there, Ms. Ritzer. Sure, I'd like to read resolution 153-20 uh, on the commendation of uh, the retirement of Robert Thompson, our code enforcement officer. Whereas the township, oh, sorry. Whereas the township of Maplewood <clears throat> desires to convey to Robert Bob Thompson an expression of its appreciation and grateful acknowledgement for the valued services rendered by him as an employee of the township department of community development for the last 24 years, whereas Robert Thompson has given generously of his time and efforts in a dignified, faithful, friendly, and professional manner to township residents, and whereas the township committee sincerely appreciates the worthwhile contributions Robert Thompson has made towards the material development, communal welfare, safety, and quality of life in the township, and whereas on the occasion of his 24 years of service, RT, Robert Thompson, is retiring to start the next exciting chapter of his life. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Township Committee of the Township of Maplewood, County of Essex, State of New Jersey, <clears throat> that the Township expresses to Robert Thompson its sincere congratulations on the occasion of his retirement. So moved. Second. Second. Yes. Mr. Zuluka. Mr. Lambert? Yes. Yes. Mary Dean. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. And congratulations to Mr. Thompson again. We appreciate your service to our community um, and wish you the best uh, on your retirement. 
I have Paulina. Bob's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm here to interrupt you. No worries, go ahead. I said, I have Bob's uh, supervisor, Annette De Palma here too, who'd like to say a few words uh, as well. Oh, that's great. Mr. Palma, please. Um, hi, I just want to uh, thank RT for all the wonderful work he's done. Uh, I've worked with him for about 14 years. I've learned a lot from him. If you ever need to know the backstory about um, any property project, street changing in Maplewood, you can always ask uh, RT, uh, who is kind of the master of the tangents, the fun tangents. Um, it's not always e easy to live and work in the same place, especially when you're doing enforcement and somehow RT managed to be uh, graceful and professional and uh, got the job done under sometimes you know, kind of quirky circumstances. And um, I appreciate, uh, again, everything I've learned from him and he's been a pleasure to work with. And um, I'll see you around, RT. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. And again, thank you, Robert, for your service. We are now on agenda item number six, our first public comment on agenda items only. Um, seeing none on YouTube, uh, uh, Glenn, do we have any others on, uh, on Zoom? We do. Um, we have uh, Sage Torito. Sage, I will uh, unmute you now. Good evening, Mr. Torito. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I would just like to ask about the breakfast and lunch program. Um, I was wondering if, um, certain barriers to service have been taken into account, such as um, transportation, um, people's work schedules, and dietary needs, and things like that. Thank you for your question. Uh, I will answer uh, what I can, and I also um, I'll open the floor to uh, Ms. Davenport as well as to our health officer. I actually was at the facility um, this morning, uh, observing and, and assisting. Um, and I can say that, uh, you know, there's, there's a certain, certain times of the day that it has to happen because, it, you know, you just can't have it 24-7. There are an outdoor space, so, you know, uh, there is a tent there in the event of inclement weather. Uh, in terms of food, uh, you know, the food is essentially what we receive. Uh, so there is some food there that, uh, you know, is, 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 is good in nutrition um, uh, and a, a value. Um, so, you know, if you have nut allergies, for example, like someone in my family does, uh, there are alternatives to that. There's not just peanut butter lying around there. Uh, from a transportation perspective, you know, it's, it's a challenge. I'll be honest with you. Like we, we picked uh, Maple Crest Park because it's a central uh, area in our community. We had people that came by foot, came by bike and came by car. Uh, so, you know, there's only so much we can do with the limited amount of budget. Uh, but of course, all are welcome as, as you are as well. Uh, Ms. Davenport, would you like to add anything uh, in regards to the summer food program? No, thank you. Um, thank you for your interest. Um, so we give out about 150 breakfasts and lunches. Uh, this is our second year doing it in Maplewood. Uh, it's a partnership between the Township of Irvington and the Township of Maplewood as a satellite. It's open to all children ages 18 and under, not just Maplewood residents, but all those in South Orange, Newark, Irvington, East Orange, whoever needs a breakfast and lunch and it was 18 and under and those who are 19 and over who um, are special needs or physically or mentally disabled and going to um, a public or private school. So it's open for everyone. Um, it is from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. If you'd like to volunteer, it's there from Monday to Friday until August 21st. Um, and I'm sure they could always use a lending hand. There's the other part, which is the SOMA Shares program. Um, and they give out um, free produce, um, books, face masks, art supplies for children, and that is done at the same time between 9 and 11, um, and they're right next to us at Maplecrest Park. So Maplecrest allows us to have more space, and it's outdoors, and it's accessible, um, both from Essex Road and Boyden Parkway. Thank you, Ms. Davenport. And thank you again for your question. Glenn, any other questions uh, from the public on agenda? Uh, I have one more uh, hand raised. Uh, Matt Ward, I'm going to unmute you now. 
Go ahead. Good evening. Um, uh, my name is Matthew Ward. Uh, a couple of you on the council may know me by name. Um, I am interested in speaking about uh, Ordinance 3002-20. Um, I'm very excited for this. I commend you uh, on many, many aspects of this ordinance. Um, however, I do have a couple comments and I, one is procedurally, I think that this needs to go to the planning board for discussion. Um, and there's a couple points that I would like to bring up uh, and, and, and in, in so doing, uh, taking that to the planning board and, and further looking at this. One, um, I think that creating more housing opportunity is a great thing. Um, one that uh, is obviously geared towards seniors here uh, for I think purposes of responding to uh, COVID. But I think that there's also another conversation going on and we should look at creating housing opportunity for not just uh, uh, seniors, but also uh, people that might be of lower incomes. I think that this op is an opportunity to, to grow that affordable housing base in a way that doesn't disturb the fabric of, of Maplewood. Uh, so I would, I would encourage you guys to, to think about that. Um, I uh, also uh, was wondering if you've taken a look at best practices. I know that there's been a lot of study uh, or state policies Sorry. coming out of California that you, you should consider, but also some other things that I don't see in here, like um, is, is there exemptions from parking in this, which I think you should consider. Is, is this, does this adjust your sewer bill? Um, whether or not that's a good thing or and should be included or not is you know maybe a question of parity whether or not this should be expanded beyond what single family homes to include two family homes is another question of, of uh, parity here and, and maybe um, so it doesn't disproportionately uh, help uh, areas where there's larger homes versus smaller homes or uh, greater incomes versus lesser incomes so I, I just wish you think about that and again I commend you Thank you, Mr. Ward, uh, for your comments. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, and I will say my answer in response to you is that duly noted, and I, I think there's always an opportunity, and I look at it as a phased approach. So, you know, we have this ordinance uh, on first passage, uh, and we'll see how that goes, but that doesn't mean we can't build upon that. So, you know, some of the ideas which I wrote down here tonight are duly noted and uh, are, are probably of great interest to several of my colleagues. So I would say that those are things that we can build upon. So, um, so thank you for that. Uh, appreciate that. And um, I think we'll take those into consideration as we continue to build on the momentum which we're trying to establish tonight. Does any um, other colleagues like to respond? Yeah, I'd just like to um, thank you for those are very thoughtful um, comments. And um, frankly, I don't know the answer to whether or not this should go before planning board, but it makes sense. Um, Mr. DeLuca, do you have, or, or Mr. Desiderio, do you have any input on that? Mr. Desiderio, why don't you answer that? We have taken the position that because it's really more, it's not a zoning ordinance, that it's not going to go to the planning board, but of course that's open to discussion. We believe that we can uh, pass it in its present form uh, without the necessity of doing that. Thank you, Mr. Desiderio. So essentially to, to that point, um, as we go through the process, and it won't be obviously in uh, tonight, but as we um, move forward and have our next meeting, which is on the 21st, uh, we can have that discussion uh, on final passage potential final passage i think if it needs to go before planning board i think maybe that's something we should talk about um sooner than later because normally it would be introduced and then go to planning board and then be brought back up um, with planning board approval or not um, for second reading and, and passage so i'm just wondering um i understand the reasons but i think um Mr. Ward raises an interesting point because when you think about uh, what what the potential of allowing ADUs is with regard to neighborhoods and essentially is this, you know, it can be perceived as a zoning issue or a use, um, 
So I'm not so sure I disagree that, that we should go before planning board and have them hash it out. But I'm just thinking, this is literally just uh, thinking out loud right now. Mr. Desiderio, do you have anything to add? Or Mr. Palma, if you're still in the call? Well, no, certainly, certainly that's up to the governing body. I mean, if, you, if, if that's the direction that you want to go ultimately, then I agree. I mean, I certainly agree with you with the process, Ms. Adams, that, it would, that if, if, if it's going to be an amendment to the zoning regulations and it's perceived as that, then it certainly, certainly has to go to the planning board for their review and comment. Um, but that's, a, that's an issue that, uh, that you, and I agree, it wouldn't make sense to have that discussion tonight if, you got, if, if you're so directing, uh, then we would, uh, we would send it to the planning board. I'm not sure it would then be able to be heard at the next meeting. Uh, I don't know when the next planning board meeting is. Uh, it might wind up it's next week to September, quite frankly. Yeah. So, uh, may I make a suggestion? We've only heard from one people. I know there may be other people that have comments. Why don't we see who else has comments? We're going to discuss this on introduction, and we can deal with all these issues at that time. Oh. Okay, I do. I do have a couple more public comment. <clears throat> uh, Jason Teb, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I'll be unmuting you now. Yeah, it's actually Tebby, but that's okay. Um, no one ever gets it right. Um, can everyone hear me? Just to make sure. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I just, yeah, most of what I want to say is to echo what Mr. Ward said. Um, yeah, I live in Maplewood um, at 37 Brookwood Drive. Um, I also think that the, the town um, should do a lot more to increase the availability of housing, especially affordable housing, especially denser housing. Um, I think the ADU is a, a good first step. Um, I hope it's um, a first step in a further direction in this way to have um, less exclusionary zoning um, in the town. Um, and also just having an ADU just to be very positive about it. Like I know people who've done this in other towns in New Jersey, it's really good for their lifestyle. It means their parents can live a more comfortable life. It means they get their children actually have like better childcare in the home, which has been really important um, these last few months, obviously. So I, I feel very positively. I do wonder about restricting it just to someone over the age of 62 that disincentivizes anyone from even building it. Um, for how long would you even have a unit so it's a good first step i just like to see more and if i can i like to i didn't realize there was the the thing with the columbus statue till tonight I, I kind of overlooked that um but i'm a history teacher it's pretty obvious that columbus's record is incredibly vile if you look into it um a lot of the statues of him were put up at a time when italian americans were sort of treated as an other and um and discriminated against so i understand that when those statues were built it was a way to claim american identity i think nowadays we understand that um he was the wrong person to be um elevating um but i also think we should be positive in how we deal with memorial spaces so if we're going to take something down we should really put something in its place that represents the values of our community and not just have it be an empty space so that's my two cents on that thank you thank you very much Glenn, anybody else? I do have one more, uh, Matthew Dunbar. All right, Matthew, you're up. Matthew, just have to unmute yourself. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. All right, great, thank you. Um, sorry, so my name's Matt Dunbar. I'm a Maplewood resident, I moved here um, about uh, about three and a half years ago, um, from uh, from the city, and and I, I'll just mention my day job because I I do uh, external affairs for Habitat for Humanity New York City, and so affordable housing is is is, uh, is kind of my 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 day business, um, and so I'm excited to be here today just to to speak in support um, of expanding the accessory dwelling unit uh, ordinance, uh, and and uh, I, I I love to see it. Um, I'm. I also, though, happen to be um, visually impaired. Um, I'm legally blind, and so when I read the ordinance, you know, I both, was both excited to see the the town going in that direction, um, but also, as was similar mentioned to our the previous speakers, um, would love to see it expanded. Um, and that, you know, that expansion may require going to the to the planning board. But um, you know. It, I, I, when I read it, I, it immediately jumped out to me, you know, why would we be, you know, 
choose to go in this direction and not include people with disabilities, um, you know, potentially, you know, low income um, families. Uh, this seems like a great opportunity to expand the city's affordable housing um, in a way that both benefits uh, people that need the housing, but also people who are dealing with, um, you know, large property tax uh, burdens that may be uh, getting too high for people to be able to afford them. Um, Shortly after I moved here, my property taxes went up by 40% uh, in the in the reassessment, and that was uh, you know on a nonprofit salary that was not uh, expected. Um, and so you know the ADU uh, expansion to include affordable housing could be both good for existing residents as well as um, as for people that need that housing. So I just wanted to to show my support for the concept, um, but would love to see it um, expanded. Uh, and similarly, I also had the concern that, you know, the way the ordinance is written, uh, it requires that in order to get approved uh, for the building, you all you have to have a senior already identified if, if the senior is not the existing homeowner, um, you would have to have a, a tenant or a person already planned. So that is fine if you have a family member that you plan on bringing in. But if you are trying to do it, uh, you know, in a way that's outside the family and don't have a tenant lined up, you, you wouldn't be approved. So I, I would like to see that that change so that the housing could get built uh, and then a, a, a resident or a tenant could be could be found afterwards would also be a, a additional improvement. Um, and, and again, uh, since I have the, the mic, um, I, I would also be in favor of replacing the Columbus statue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Um, so just, just to respond to Mr. Dunbar and, and Mr. Tabin as well, I, and also to Mr. Ward, um, we appreciate your comments and we will have discussion uh, of this uh, in the introduction of the new ordinance uh, instead of waiting traditionally for uh, final passage. And I think if I'm understanding correctly and I will discuss it more is that uh, although uh, we, we collectively feel this is a you know, good start, you'd like to see us flush this ordinance more out. So we'll have that discussion uh, shortly, uh, shortly after our Board of Health meeting. Okay, uh, Glenn, any more uh, comments from the public? Um, there are two not agenda, oh, one hand just went up, but there are two that are not agenda item related we can do later in the meeting. I have to wait, we have no, only agenda item only, please. Yeah, no, there's two that I can wait. And then uh, Liz Henry, uh, I will unmute you now. Go ahead, Liz. Okay. Uh, I have one question on this. Let's say hypothetically you were going to have a family member over 62 move in. You spend tens of thousands to rehab a garage or an area and that person left or died, let's say. Would, what would happen to that place? What would be the procedure? Would you be able to, you would only be able to rent it to somebody over 62? under this current bill. So, so Ms. Henry, I'm gonna let Mr. Desiderio answer that, but first I'd like to state that I don't wanna get into like case studies, you know, right at this point, I think I think that's a case study or you study, and you know, we can, there's so many scenarios we can come with, but Mr. Desiderio, if you'd like to address Ms. Henry's question, I appreciate it. The answer is, as it is presently drafted, her, her interpretation is correct. Okay, good. Well, I just, okay, thank you. But I just want to say I'm very, very in support of this bill. And I also think the age should be lowered or it should be far more flexible than what it currently stands at. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Mm -hmm. Mr. Malinowski, do we have any more? Uh, You're okay um, to the next agenda item, Mayor. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we are now on agenda item number seven, which is our Board of Health meeting. Uh, Mr. Daffis, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Pursuant to section five, chapter 231 of the public laws, 1975, this is to state for the record that adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the public by posting and maintaining the annual notice of regular meetings on the bulletin board of the municipal building, by mailing the annual notice of regular meetings for 2020 to the news record and the star ledger in December, 2019, and by filing said notice in the office of the township clerk. Ms. Fritzen, roll call, please.
Liz, yeah. you're muted. No, she, she's unmuted now. That? Yes, I mean here. <laughs> here. Lundberg. Here. Mayor McGee. Here. That. Here. Whereas Chapter 231, Public Laws 1975, commonly known as the Open Public Meetings Act, requires no means of public bodies to be open to the public. And where Section 7A provides that the Board of Health has the discretion to permit, permit or regulate the active participation of the public at any meeting. And whereas the desire to make the Board of Health to comply with the provision of this act. Same time conduct of business in order to make sure this matter. Now, therefore, to be the resolved by the Board of Health, and 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 the Board of the Board of Health, and 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 the Mr. Blue, yes. Mr. Robert, yes. Mayor Lee, yes. Mr. Dad, yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Uh, our next item on the agenda is the uh, approval of the minutes from our last public uh, health, uh, our Board of Health meeting on June second. Uh, they were distributed widely. I move that we adopt the minutes from the June second, twenty twenty meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Yes. 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 Thank you again, Ms. Fritzen. Uh, and now I'm going to leave the floor to uh, our public health officer, Candace Davenport. Ms. Davenport, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, so here is the beginning. Good morning, oh, good evening, everyone. This is the July 2020 Board of Health presentation. So I just wanna provide you with some uh, coronavirus updates. Uh, we are approaching in the United States, 3 million cases, um, and unfortunately 131,000 um, deaths in the United States. In New Jersey, our state cases are 174,000, um, and our deaths are, around 13,476. We continue to be on an average of 350 to 400 new cases of coronavirus in New Jersey every day. And there have been 51 uh, multi-symptom inflammatory disease cases in pediatrics uh, from 11 counties in New Jersey. Within our own county, Essex County, we have 18,920 cases. And of those 10% of that, or close to 10% of that is confirmed deaths and 241 probable deaths due to COVID. I wanna just highlight here um, an, the New Jersey estimated rate of uh, virus replication. Governor Murphy um, made an announcement on Monday and warned that the rate of transmission of coronavirus in New Jersey recently exceeded the critical number of one for the first time in 10 weeks, as you can see here. So if you refer to the bottom, on March 21st, our stay at home order was issued and our um, infectious rate was up at five. We did an amazing job of decreasing that to um, close to 0 0.7 uh, as of a month ago when we moved to stage two and we are now um, creeping back up to um, a more, uh, a higher repl replicability and reproduction rate of the virus. So as public health, we are watching this very closely. Um, just wanna emphasize that the rate of transmission, as you can see here, measures how much the virus is spreading in the state. If it's larger than one, that means on average, every newly infected resident is now passing COVID-19 to at least one person. New Jersey's rate, which topped up to five in March, um, fell to almost 0.62 on June 11th, which is the 0.7. Um, right there. And then the daily positivity rate in New Jersey, which is the percentage of positive COVID-19 tests in a single day, was 3.23% as of last Saturday, um, when the rate was hovered, hovering around 2% lately. These two things, uh, your transmission rate and your positivity rate, your daily positivity rate, 
are uh, two of the most key metrics in, in public health for determining how the state is gonna manage the spread and how many more restrictions can be lifted or pulled back. Some people may ask why the increase, and I'll just go back. Um, the increases can be attributed to a couple of moving factors. One is travelers and residents returning from other states with high cases of COVID-19, um, participating in large gatherings, potentially over the holiday weekend, and more activity and public interaction uh, with the reopenings. So because of this increase, face coverings as of uh, today, um, the governor's releasing executive order saying that face coverings are now required, no longer recommended, but required when outdoors, when a six foot distance from others cannot be maintained. It's important to note that for public health, wearing a mask or face covering, staying six feet apart um, and avoiding large crowds or gatherings is primary prevention. It's the first and most important step that we can do to prevent the, the spread of COVID-19, including washing your hands. But this only works if everyone is doing it. Again, we've always reiterated before, and I will say it again, the mask that you wear protects others from you and your potentially infectious respiratory droplets. When everybody else wears one, they're protecting you. Um, so it really works if everyone does um, their share. It's hard to figure out when to go out. Do I go out? Do I stay in? How much of the reopening do I participate in? Do I jump right in? It depends on risk. So I have two um, documents or flyer um, um, notices here. Uh, one is from the Texas Medical Association, um, which determines different aspects of activity for low risk to high risk. And so you can use this as a gauge to see, is this a risky behavior? Um, and perhaps maybe if I do, um, if I attend a backyard or, or go to a park, maybe if I go at an earlier time or when it's less crowded, that becomes a lower risk, right? The next one to the right is um, another risk assessment from the state health department. And it pretty much says time, space, people and place are the four things you should really consider when you um, attempt to engage and, and um, re-enter into um, various aspects of society. So I'd like to refer to those for um, determining people's risks and what they feel comfortable with. Moving on to Maplewood's COVID-19 status, our cumulative number of cases in Maplewood has held at um, 317 and we breathe a sigh of relief uh, for that, that our numbers are staying uh, steady and not increasing. Our number of daily cases, which is the green uh, bars below, as you can see are low. You can see the spaces in between indicate we don't receive a lot of cases um, every day, um, but we are monitoring it. And then finally, the total number of cases um, which is 317, um, and our recovered cases, which is actually 266 um, total recovered cases, um, is getting closer, and that means we're, we don't have as many cases, um, and that's really good. Um, I should also mention that more than 70,700 residents in the state have recovered from the virus, um, which was not included in earlier, but that was according to Johns Hopkins University. I wanna highlight here that um, the age distribution of COVID-19 in Maplewood, as you can see the zero accounts for children zero to nine. Um, so that's a, a good thing. And then uh, 10, 10 to 19 is the 1%. And then we move on further. Unfortunately, you begin to see that ages 50 to 59 um, and, and 40 to 49 are at higher risk um, for the number of cases that we see. And then I thought this might be interesting is just to see the number of older adults, because even though um, younger people can get the disease, maybe they're not as affected, maybe they're you know, asymptomatic or they have mild symptoms. Unfortunately, those with underlying health conditions and who are advanced age um, have uh, higher hospitalizations and um, negative sequelae from COVID-19 infection. I'd also like to point out for age distribution that we are carefully watching the age distribution of new cases, as we have seen nationally, especially in the South, an increase in new cases among young adults ages 25 to 34. Uh, some of those are due to um, going to beach, uh, going to the beaches, public beaches, social gatherings, going to bars, et cetera. In New Jersey, 
percentage of testing positive for COVID between the ages of 18 years and, nine, and 29 years of age went from 12% in April to 22% in June. So again, the number of cases that were testing positive in that age group um, are increasing. So we're watching that carefully. Um, I wanna highlight that in the last month, we have been very busy in Maplewood trying to provide testing and make that accessible to our residents and to the county. We partnered with the county on June 12th to do the Essex County drive-through COVID testing at the Maplewood Community Pool. The site was excellent for a drive-through, so thank you to the police department, DPW, um, and our, our recreation department for helping to facilitate that. Um, we tested 203 people. This was countywide, uh, so that was great, and Essex County was a great partner for that. On June 8th to July 2nd, we had Salerno Medical Associates here for a mobile van testing behind uh, the county OEM building at the Maple Community Pool. This was a walk-up or appointment only, and we tested 1,500 patients um, at that site. So um, that was amazing. On June 16th, we also partnered with Salerno to have the senior apartment residents tested, um, and that was great too. And then on June 29th, when we, um, opened it up to our 59 township employees uh, res uh, responded to get tested. So hopefully we are increasing the number of um, people who got tested and moving on to where do we go next for testing as we reopen. So as the state reopens, it's important for people to get tested. If you go to these websites, um, covid19.nj.gov um, has a page for testing sites where you can go to just enter in our zip code uh, of 07040, and it'll give you a whole list of places. CVS Pharmacy on Valley Street also has a drive-through uh, COVID testing site. However, um, you have to be symptomatic and there's a screening criteria for that. Finally, EssexCOVID.org is always um, a great resource where the county, just like we did here on June 12th, is having sites not only in Weekweb Park in Newark, but also throughout the county just to make it more accessible. Some people have asked us at the health department, well, who should get tested and when? I highlighted here the five um, criteria for judging whether you should get tested. So those who have close contact with a suspect or positive COVID case, if you are symptomatic with COVID-19 symptoms, if you are an essential worker or recently attended a large crowd or gathering or public in a public space, and recently traveled to a state with an increase in COVID-19 cases. Those would be the, the high priority, um, as well as anyone who works or lives in a long-term care facility or congregate housing. Um, people have asked when they should get tested. The data right now says that um, you, if you think that you're one of these people and you think you've been exposed, then you should get tested about three to seven days or um, roughly five days after your initial exposure. That's when the virus has had enough time to build up and it'll show up um, most accurately in the testing. So welcome to New Jersey. We have travel advisories. Um, as of Tuesday, July 7th, there are currently 19 states that currently meet the criteria that you have to um, issue a travel advisory for individuals entering New Jersey from these states. Um, that have a significant spread of COVID-19. All residents or travelers from these states should quarantine for 14 days after leaving that state. The 14-day quarantine travel advisory applies to travel from certain states identified as those who have a positive COVID test rate higher than 10 per 100,000 residents or have a 10% or higher positivity rate over a seven-day rolling average. These uh, states and um, the criteria will change uh, over time. They will announce the states as they put them on the list or take them off um, every Monday, according to the governor's office. Ms. Davenport, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Um, how do they enforce that? Is this people driving in? Are they, you know, are they looking at license plates? Is this people at airports? I mean, how is this being? enforced because obviously until we have a national some sort of leadership on a national level people are gonna you know travel over state lines and and we're never gonna be rid of this until there's something like that but in the meantime if we're doing this 
Um, do you have any information that could help people understand, like if I have a relative in North Carolina, can they come here? Mm -hmm. What what the Sure. So it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I'll start from an, a, another perspective, which is, as you see these states, if you're planning your summer vacation, then it would be consider um, and proceed with caution if you're planning for a vacation and perhaps reschedule or um, revisit your plans for attending um, and putting your vacation in those in those states because they are currently high COVID states and their positivity rates of COVID are increasing, unfortunately. If you have family members who are coming here, um, you have to evaluate, you know, how long can will they stay here and would it be possible for them to quarantine uh, for 14 days? Quarantine is not, the quarantine is not um, regulated or um, enforceable. It's, it's really a social contract of understanding that if you come from these, these areas, you could potentially bring COVID-19 to New Jersey and back to um, the residents here. So it's an understanding that if you are traveling back from these, please consider the 14 day quarantine to prevent the further spread of disease um, because these are high COVID areas right now. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Comcare, New Jersey um, is, it has now started um, as of July 6th, which is this Monday, on a Comcare contact tracing program statewide. Essex County, including Maple, the township of Maple, was a pilot county and pilot town for testing the contact tracing program. And we did that um, three weeks ago. It has been a learning curve, but very interesting. Um, why is contact tracing important? This is all the more important as we reopen uh, the state and have more contacts. Contact tracing allows public health professionals to find the close contacts of a positive COVID patient. From that patient, they let us know their contacts and then through this system, we're able to contact them and then send out reminders via um, SMS messaging on their cell phone. Um, every day, they would be monitored like, hi, um, just checking on how you're feeling. It's an automated process. If you're not feeling well, click here and it takes them back to um, a contact tracer who can then put them in, in contact with a healthcare provider should they begin to feel signs and symptoms and don't know what to do. So this is a really great program to help us um, provide further education to contacts to quarantine and isolate them and close that loop so that we prevent the further spread of disease. Ms. Davenport, can I interject here? I yes, just sir. want to make it clear to the public since we have uh, a good deal of the public with us tonight. We're really grateful for that. Uh, contact tracing didn't just start. It was happening all along the way, yes, but, right. but our efforts were never uh, uniform and centralized through a uniform database like Comcare. That's and correct. that is what we're talking about now. We have that now. Is that right? That is correct. Um, so in our office, for example, with all of the 317 cases, those were our patient zeros. From there, because of the stay-at-home um, orders, most of their contacts were at their uh, work, work site or workplace and household contacts. So we monitored those and it was an easy, um, it was an easy loop because there was such few people and contacts. As we begin to expand, um, we have to start remembering who we had contact with, where we've been, um, what's considered a close contact and are we practicing the six foot distance and the masking, which is so, so important. So this is why contact tracing and comp care is gonna be so crucial. I also wanna highlight um, that if the public health department, um, either us in Maplewood or another township, um, if, you are, if you have family who, or friends who live in another town, call you, please answer the phone um, and help us to provide that information. It really helps us to close the loop and um, teach others about whether they should quarantine or isolate. Um, in order to prevent the spread of disease. So we appreciate uh, the public's effort in, um, in talking to us during um, our investigations. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, speaking of thank yous, I wanna thank Moro Church and the Moro Musical Theater Camp uh, for their generosity in supplying local public health, our, our health department with um, 500 thermometers and 10,000 thermometer sheets for families in need of thermometers as well as 2,500 face masks to put in our care packages to residents. This has been an amazing gift to us. Uh, we are so appreciative of your generosity. Thank you so very much. Um, you are great partners in our community and, and 
we are very, very grateful. As you may recall back in March when we were interviewing um, our cases and in April, there were several cases of ours and residents who either didn't have a thermometer or didn't have a thermometer that worked. So when you ask someone, do you have a fever? They say, I feel feverish, but I don't have a thermometer that works, so I can't tell you what my temperature is. We are now able to put thermometers um, in their care packages, and that is a huge help um, to many of our, our local residents, so thank you. Moving off of COVID and onto other topics uh, that our local health department um, focuses on, uh, tick-borne and Lyme disease. This is the season where not only are people going out, um, but with the reopening, people are very excited to get out into the parks. Uh, we want to emphasize that please don't let a tick make you sick when you go out to uh, places like the South Mountain Reservation or any of our state or county parks. Um, please use uh, tick repellent on your skin and clothing and do a tick check before or you go home. Um, if you need um, a graphic for how to do a tick check, we have one on our township website. Um, and please stay on the, the trails that are already cleared um, and avoid walking in the tall grasses. That's where the, the ticks tend to lay um, and, and are, are, are there. So they can cling to your socks or shoes or to your dog's fur um, or to other places um, on your body. So uh, we hope that people will be careful when they go out into our, our parks and open spaces. In terms of environmental health, um, with rat control, we've had 64 complaints in June that we've responded to thanks to our um, environmental health inspector. Um, we have multiple locations in, in Maplewood that we're trying to um, help the residents to abate uh, properties for uh, food and shelter sources. That's the reason why rats will stay. We wanna mitigate that as much as possible. And we're working with our building department to include education in the building permit packets uh, regarding rat control prior to construction. This is really important as well. Childhood lead poisoning is another big um, responsibility of the local health department. We contract with the East Orange Health Department to assist us in conducting lead poisoning outreach, clinical follow-up, and residential inspections, and provide residents and landlords with resources for remediation. Um, there's a state health website for childhood lead. If people have questions about what childhood lead, childhood lead is still an issue. Um, it is still a concern. Um, in New Jersey, children are required to be tested at ages one and two years of age. And any child who is less than six years of age who has not been tested or who has been exposed to a suspect or known source of lead. For example, if you're doing a do-it-yourself home remediation or construction and you have young children in the house, it might be a good idea um, well, you should get like a, a professional contractor um, so that the, the spread of, of lead um, from taking down a, a wall or, or um, destroying the lead paint um, that might be there from, from prior years um, doesn't get dispersed. But um, you should also get your children tested. Um, it's, it's really important to prevent um, childhood lead poisoning. It's very preventable. I wanna also highlight that um, in 2019, Approximately 98 children in Maplewood were tested. All were about one years of, of age or less. Um, so there is an opportunity that I wanna highlight here uh, for families to increase their screening and for pediatricians to increase their screening to also include those children who are at two years of age um, and those children who are six years of age who have not been tested before or have been exposed. So doing a um, environmental health history with families and asking them if they've done a recent construction um, if they've uh, traveled or use um, some homemade products that were from another country that use vibrant colors um, or types of jewelry or spices, there's an environmental health um, interview or screening process that pediatricians can use. So I'm really hoping that with this information, more families will ask their pediatrician to do so. Back in March, the township signed a, um, and approved a township vaping ordinance, which would allow, um, which would remove um, stores from selling vape products unless they became a solely vape product um, merchant. Um, they were allowed to sell tobacco along with that, but they would sell nothing else like um, water or juice or, or gum or, or snacks. So um, as of now, it is now in effect, and we have gone to um, six locations this week, thanks to the help of um, our, a re, a, an, another environmental health inspector with the Essex uh, Regional Health Commission. They're, they've been a great partner with lending us um, some help uh, 
during this COVID um, time uh, to get back to our inspections. And we're informing the merchants of the township ordinance. And once they're informed, they have been compliant with removing the, the vaping products off of their shelves. Um, Ms. Davenport, can I just <laughs> clarify? Because uh, this came up <clears throat> and I had to have it checked. Uh, the ordinance was passed, but it was not published until April 16th. And it's 90 days after publication that it goes into effect. April so 16th? Uh, yeah, April 16th. So it's July 5th, 14th is when it goes, is uh, actually in effect. Okay. Okay. Um, we will inform them of that and tell them that it is July 14th. Okay. I'm sure some of our merchants will be happy to hear about that, but then it ends on July 14th and then they have to take it back down again because vaping is bad for public health. Finally, we have our summer meals program. Um, I wanna thank uh, the township committee um, for uh, the resolution 158-20 uh, and 159-20, uh, which uh, approves the, the passing of the summer meals program and for the uh, coordinator, Marcel McNeil, who has been there every day um, uh, coordinating the, the volunteers and the food and, and all the paperwork uh, that needs to be reported to the USDA program um, and to Trenton um, for those who organize the program. Um, it has been a great success. Uh, they've, as I mentioned before, given out 150 breakfasts and lunches. They give them out together um, and any child can come and it's open to the public. So we hope uh, as, as Mayor McGee, he did that all of the township community people and all of our residents will go out to um, see what a great program it is and see the type of food that they're able to provide um, and maybe lend a lending hand um, and a happy smile and face to greet the, the kids and the families because they're very happy to see everyone. It's, it's a great place to be because they're in the parks, they get to, to run around, they get some fresh air, um, they get to meet a happy face every morning from Monday to Friday um, at 9 to 11. And um, it's a really great program. I'm, I'm very proud of, of, of this program because we're able to help children in need during the summer. Okay, and that is it for me. Or thank you, um, we're open to questions. Are there any questions from my colleagues? For Ms. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, Ms. Davenport, do you have any information on, um, with regard to COVID and, and the way businesses operate? Do you have any information? Is there any way to find any as to whether or not uh, disposable dishware or plastic cups is any better than traditional um, plates that get washed in a commercial dishwasher? Um, there are some uh, restaurant businesses that are using only disposable plastics, which as we know is something we were trying to get away from. Um, and I don't know that there's any scientific basis for them to do that. And I think it would be helpful for people to know whether or not that makes them safer than eating off of, you know, washed real plates and, and dishware. Do you have any comment on that? Sure, so that has come up um, as a question. And when we've looked at the research, it, n there's not really much research that says that the transmission is from um, silverware or, or plateware. When you go to a restaurant, it's more of the respiratory droplets. So I, when you go to a restaurant, all of the restaurant workers, including from wait staff to um, the people who are working in the kitchen, all have to wear gloves. Um, this gloves, these gloves are, are necessary so that they can load the dishwashers um, without contact with um, utensils that people have put into their mouths, right? Um, but it's really the main way of transmission for COVID-19 is through respiratory droplets um, from when we talk and speak and sing and yell um, and cough and sneeze. That's really the main way. Um, there is the potential that you can uh, get it from touching contaminated surfaces. Um, and then touching your face, but that is less of a mode of transmission than the respiratory droplets itself. Right, so there's not um, 
any truth to like, oh, we have to use disposable everything. Restaurants should be using all disposable products so that, you know, it doesn't spread it. So that's that's the myth that I, I would like addressed strong enough so that restaurants and patrons of those restaurants can understand that there's no danger in going to a restaurant, at least from that perspective. Maybe if you get too close to somebody or somebody's not wearing sure. a mask, that kind of stuff. Yes. But as far as the utensils and the dish where they're using, it's, it's fine for restaurants to use their regular real plates and real glasses so long yes. as they're washed. So long as they're washed. And really the most important thing is keeping that six foot distance um, as with outdoor dining, as we've measured it out, it's from uh, the back of the chair to the other back of the chair of a separate table. Um, it's really the social distancing part of it. And like I said, um, staff should be wearing gloves uh, to reduce contact with anything that people have put into their mouths um, with respiratory droplets. Um, so there's not much concern, but with washing, it should be fine. So it's more, the gloves are more for the protection of the staff themselves than the patrons. Correct. Yeah. Um, also, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Ms. Adams, go ahead. I just also wanted to ask a question if there's any plans to expand testing that you know of or have heard of with uh, whether or not there'll be more of what you, demo you, you illustrated in your presentation um, about the county sites that have tested. I know that a lot of people are waiting too long for results. You wait eight days for results and you could have be negative eight days ago and then be positive by the time you get your te negative test result back. Do you have any information on it? Right, so um, let me address those two factors. One is, yes, people have seen an increase in the number of, of, of days that they're waiting between test results. Uh, the reason being for that is because of the, um, the routine weekly testing that is being done at long-term care facilities and uh, the increase of testing at various sites um, in the last uh, month, month and a half. So the labs are kind of inundated. They're, they're, they're really like, oh my gosh, like, how do we handle this, this influx of, of labs? So we, we ask for people's patience as the labs ramp up. Um, the other question is, if you refer to the, the links that I provided, and I'm, I think we can share my PowerPoint. Um, if you go to EssexCOVID.org, for example, you can book a, and schedule an appointment. You can also go to any, um, urgent care facility um, like City MD or MediExpress, if you or Summit Medical Group, if you'd like to do that faster, like within the day. Um, and finally, we will have Salerno Medical Associates back here in the fall. I feel like as as when we are starting to open up and schools start to open up, there will be um, more of an increased interest uh, for that, as well as because we're sharing the Maplewood Community Pool parking lot, and now the pool is open. Um, we didn't want there to be a, a conflict of spacing. So um, I think people were very interested for it to come back in the fall and they're happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else, any of my colleagues who wanted to ask a question to Ms. Davenport? Mr. Daffis, I thought there was, there was some interest, I think earlier today of Township Committee people talking about mask wearing in the park. Are we gonna talk about that now or later? I think we're going to cover it uh, later, Mr. DeLuca, if, if you don't mind, and then we'll bring Ms. Davenport back into the discussion at that time. I wanted to ask Ms. Davenport a question. Uh, I just want to clarify that uh, to Ms. Adams' original question regarding the disposable utensils that some of our restaurants are using in their outdoor dining, uh, there isn't anything in the state recommendations or public health directives we received uh, suggesting or recommending disposable utensils. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, okay, great. It's good to know. So at this point, uh, I'm gonna invite the public. Thank you all for being so patient and staying with us tonight. Glad to see you again. Uh, invite the public to address the board. Is there anyone? Mr. Michalowski. I think Ms. the mayor had a question for you. Oh, sorry. That's okay. It's uh, okay. technology. Um, just a, a point of interest, and I do agree that I prefer us not to use plastic wear, but I'm going to take the, the shoes of the individual who works in the restaurant, the bus person, and the person in the back who's doing the, the washing of the dishes. You know, I think we got to be sensitive to them and their families who would have the highest potential exposure to COVID because they're taking all these dishes and stuff from multiple people regardless they're wearing gloves or not. So I'd like us to 
on parallel, if, we, if we're going to push a narrative for our restaurants to start to use non-plastic wear, and I'm fine with that, that we also work with these restaurant owners to find ways to make sure that their employees get tested because they are at a higher risk than anyone else because they're grabbing multiple dishes over multiple period of time. So I'm just taking the lens of the person behind the restaurant, cleaning the dishes and putting and touching them, putting the dishwasher. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with you on that, um, but they're, whether they're, that's to Ms. Davenport's point, they need to wear gloves if they're a worker because whether they're picking up a dish that's plastic and disposable or a dish that's washable, they're still picking it up to bust the table. So I agree they should be tested more, for sure. Yeah, de de dishwasher, I'm thinking especially. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Mayor, that's a good point. Uh, and thank you for bringing it up. So are there members of the public who would like to address the Public Health Board? We do, we have one. Uh, Liz Henry, I'm gonna unmute you. You can go ahead. Ah, two things. Uh, during the height of the virus where everyone was flipped out, my son got sick and I called Miss Davenport to ask what I should do. And I wanna say she was unbelievably fabulous warm, friendly, told me everything I needed to know. And she's the height of public service. Um, secondly, uh, concerning uh, the town square that's closed off uh, every evening, I'm wondering why you can only have a drink inside the tent. I wouldn't mind going out to have a drink, but I don't want to be in such close contact. And if you could be possible to change that, where you could stand outside the tent. Uh, that's the only question I have, thanks. So thank you, Liz, and thank you for the salute to Candace Davenport. We agree with you fulsomely. She is a remarkable, uh, remarkable. She's our frontline uh, warrior to this pandemic and she's incredible, so thank you. Um, and Candace, I'm gonna ask you to back me up here. So uh, that issue about alcohol consumption outside of the expanded outdoor premises is definitely governed by state law and uh, the, guide, the special permit guidance that the state ABC put together for our licensees to follow. It is not permitted essentially. So uh, while I appreciate what you're saying, Liz, um, and I wouldn't disagree with you necessarily on a personal level, uh, it is strictly for prohibited for licensees to serve alcohol and for patrons to consume that alcohol outside of the expanded premises uh, of their outdoor dining. In other words, outside of the parklets that were created. And, and we are strictly enforcing that. Ms. Davenport, do you wanna add anything to that? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Daffis. I believe that in the executive directive, it also says that if you're gonna serve uh, food in outdoor dining, all drinks and food must be served when the person is seated. And the person has to sit at the restaurant outdoor, at the outdoor seating and eat or drink whatever's uh, bought from that restaurant on site. Right, so I hope that answers your question, uh, Liz. Are there any more questions from the public? Not at this time. Thank you, Mr. Michalowski. With that, I move that we adjourn our public health meeting tonight and we uh, resume next uh, on Tuesday, August 4th. Second. Yes. 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 Mayor McGee. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Thank you, Mr. Daffis. And thank you, uh, Ms. Davenport, uh, for your excellent report and excellent service to our community. We are now moving on to agenda item number eight, the 2020 municipal budget. Mayor, this is the uh, time fix for the virtual public hearing on the 2020 municipal budget. The budget was amended by the governing body on June 16, 2020, and was advertised as required by law on July 2nd, 2020, together with notice of hearing for this time. Uh, printed copies have been made available to the public during the past week. 
And then we do have a supply here for anyone desiring a copy. Anyone who has not secured a copy of the budget may theoretically try to do so now. <laughs> the door is open. Mayor, I have a resolution regarding the meeting of the budget by title only. I offer the foregoing resolution and move its adoption. Resolution is adopted. Before opening this hearing, I wish to outline the procedure. Each person desiring to be heard will give his or her name and address before speaking. I will recognize one speaker at a time, as nearly as I can determine. Address all questions to the chair. Where necessary, they will be referred to individual members of the governing body or municipal officials. Questions must be confined solely to the municipal budget before us. School and county members, county matters, are not proper subjects of this hearing and cannot be discussed or answered here tonight. I now declare open the public hearing for the 2020 municipal budget. Okay, it's got to go in. Sorry, I'm getting hit on all sides, email, chat, and uh, hands raising. Um, I have a, <laughs> okay, I have an Edgar Galvis, 37 Boyden Ave. Was there any consideration to having pay freezes with our two biggest budget items, police and fire department, as a way to mitigate budget shortfalls due to COVID-19, just like South Orange did with their budget? If this was not considered, how come? Mr. Galvin, uh, Galvin, is that correct? Galvis, correct. Gal Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Uh, yes, that was taken under consideration uh, amongst other uh, scenarios as well. Um, for the last uh, six plus months, uh, we have been looking uh, at all scenarios regarding uh, revenues and expenses toward this budget. And that was taken under consideration and not just for uh, our two uh, most uh, expensive departments, if you will, but all departments. So the answer to that question is yes. Any other questions, Glenn? Um, checking all my avenues. No, not at this time. Thank you. I'm observing no further applications, applicants on the, for the floor. I will entertain a motion to close the hearing. I move we close the hearing. Can I get a second, please? I'll second. Perfect, thank you. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Baptist? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lambert? Yes. Yes, thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Um, Mayor, I have a resolution to present at this time amending the municipal budget for the year 2020. May I get a second? Second. Okay. Mayor, let me uh, read uh, resolution number 161 20. Thank you. Section two adoption of the municipal budget for the year 2020. The resolution is adopted. Well, let me get the motion first. May I get a motion? Yeah, I move the, uh, I, uh, move the adoption of the resolution. Can I get a second, please? I'll second. Yes. Mr. Dathis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor Yes. Thank you. The resolution is adopted. Thank you. The resolution is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Kaloje. Uh, I want to recognize you for your uh, efforts uh, in this process, uh, as well as Mr. DeLuca and Ms. Riveros. Um, I could say that we had somewhere between 20 to 30 meetings over the last six months uh, and spent hours that I can't even uh, comprehend at this point, taking into consideration everything that we tried to do uh, and continue to do under uh, COVID-19. 
We are Mr. Now Mayor? Yes. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, it, do, does the adoption of the budget need to be postponed pending further review by the division or is that no longer necessary? Maybe that's a question for Mr. Koloje. Mr. Koloje. There we go. Hope they unmuted. Hopefully not sounding like a chipmunk. No, the state gave us uh, a free and clear approval to adopt our budget on uh, Friday. Oh, uh oh, okay, great. Thank you. And I refer to his uh, the memo uh, that Mr. Close they provide us with as well, with uh, with some detail in there also. Okay, we are now on agenda item number thirteen. Mayor, uh, introduction, a new ordinance, ordinance number 3002-20. The ordinance will allow, pursuant to certain rules and regulations, the occupancy of an accessory dwelling unit in designated residential areas. This ordinance will allow the occupancy of an accessory dwelling unit as here defined in certain residential areas within the township where one person is at least 62 years of age or older. Yeah, motion please, Mr. DeLuca. I move the passage of this ordinance on first reading. It's publication on the Maple South Orange News Code and hearing to be held on July 21st, 2020. I second. Uh, it's time for discussion. I think we'll uh, we'll, we'll uh, continue our discussion. Um, so as it was brought up during our public comment uh, by Mr. Ward, Mr. Tab, and Mr. Dunbar, uh, there are some and Ms. Adams. There are some questions about uh, the current uh, state of this ordinance. Uh, so let's open up the floor to the discussion. Some of the things that were discussed was uh, the age factor, uh, income and also uh, special uh, needs uh, or disabilities. Uh, Ms. Adam, would you, Ms. Adams, would you like to continue this conversation, please? Sure. Um, I, I was actually gonna uh, pitch it over to Mr. Daffis since he's head of uh, code committee because we've been talking about this for quite some time um, and there's been a lot of back and forth. So I have, I have some things to say, but I think Mr. Daffis should probably tee us up. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I want to provide a little bit of context of how we got here. Uh, as I was a champion for this uh, about a year ago, or so time flies, it could have been more than a year ago. Uh, this came to uh, my attention through my liaison work with uh, our health and wellness, so much two towns for all ages, uh, healthy living uh, work committee. Uh, and our senior coordinator, uh, we had actually some, someone mentioned earlier, if this is in best practice with what California is doing, we actually had someone from Berkeley uh, come and speak to us at the Woodland and, and do a presentation about ADUs, which are becoming very popular again uh, as an affordable housing option across the nation. They were very popular in the 70s and fell out of favor. Uh, but they are becoming, again, uh, very popular as an alternate way of providing affordable housing without necessarily adding to the density, uh, without adding to density. Um, so considering the context, the context was the missing middle, missing middle housing. Uh, and the context in particular from our Soma Two Towns for All Ages initiative was uh, affording our seniors the opportunity to age in place. Uh, for many of our seniors, uh, you know, remaining in our community is just not an option for them because it's become so unaffordable. And the uh, residential units that have been built in terms of multi-unit dwellings uh, are not affordable to them. So this was where, how this came to be. Uh, the context uh, in which we started researching this. So we've had a lot of conversations with the Berkeley people, did a little bit of a research into other municipalities, including uh, a New Jersey municipality. I'm gonna cue Mr. DeLuca to talk about that a little bit. Um, and, and so this is how we got started. We got started as uh, looking at this as, a, as an affordable housing option and aging in place initiative which is why uh, 
it is currently restricted to seniors, uh, either as the owner of the single family uh, dwelling or as the resident in the ADU. Um, and, and why uh, it was, uh, in terms of zoning, uh, set up in the way that it was, single family um, residential zones. Uh, in terms of senior, we went with the definition of the state definition of senior. Uh, everything is defined as 62 and older in New Jersey in terms of senior benefits, senior housing, senior social services, et cetera, et cetera. So we adopted that. Uh, I am open to a lot of the great uh, comments that were made um, to expand this beyond our current, uh, you know, purview here. Uh, but I wanted to give people a little bit of context of how we got here. So I'm going to cue Mr. DeLuca and uh, Mr. Palma, if she's still available with us tonight, our community uh, development uh, director. The two of them have done a lot of job a lot of work rather in drafting the ordinance. And I think that we probably uh, unintentionally, unintentionally uh, sort of like restricted ourselves without intending to do so. Uh, so maybe they can comment a little bit more about some of our choices. Uh, I also think that Ms. Adams has a good point. Um, since zoning review will be required anyway uh, for anyone who sets one of these up, uh, it probably should go to plan for, for discussion and review, um, and, and their their input will be instrumental in how we roll this out. So, without further ado, Mr. DeLuca. Uh, thank you, Mr. Daffis. So, uh, just to put a little bit more into sort of the pattern of what we've been working on over the last couple of years under your leadership on the Soma Two Towns. Um, we did some work earlier on uh, a year or two ago on the co-housing and changing the border uh, ordinance that we had to allow, um, again, uh, more co-housing opportunities for families 60, that had someone 62 years of old or uh, 62 or older in the household. Um, with this, when you brought this to our attention, we went and looked at some of the models around the, the country uh, we did use the uh, a New Jersey ordinance in, from Bergen County, old uh, Tappan um, New, uh, the borough, and we also looked at the National Association of Home Buyers, Home Builders, rather, um, as to some of their model ordinance uh, language. Um, I and and so this is how we drafted it, and we, as you know, we went through a lot of different um, drafts before putting it to paper. I would have to say that. Uh, I, I think we were a little more intentional than we may be stating here about being at 62 because uh, we had the same question around the border is the border and co-housing co uh, program as we do with this is um, to try to figure out how you don't create um, overcrowded uh, accessory units, sort of the uh, a frat house type thing. Um, and so we, we kind of decided to go this direction because it was, uh, there was no ambiguity about the legality of it because you can set up something with a very defined population. When you start to change the definition of the population, Mr. Desiderio will certainly, you know, feel free to jump in. You then have to meet the test of, are you treating someone different than another? Um, so established groups like seniors, those with disabilities, um, uh, you, can, you can justify. Uh, yeah, I think when we get somewhat beyond that, it gets a little bit of a question. Um, so this is where we came up. Uh, there's one other thing is the difference in what we, uh, in, in Old Japan, uh, or Tappan, I guess it's called, um, they did have a procedure of it having to go through the, the to a planning board. We took that out and now it's a direct um, uh, certificate of occupancy by our building official because we wanted to cut down on the cost of having to develop this. It's, uh, it's gonna be enough just to build it, but having to go through a, a procedure of going for a site plan or approval through a planning board, we thought would be difficult. So. Um, I, I, just to give you my uh, thing, I, 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 if it, if procedurally, if we want to send it to the planning board, 
I mean, the only thing they're going to say is whether or not it's consistent with the master plan. That's their charge. So um, if, if people feel that that's, uh, we should do that, I would like Mr. Desideri to weigh in on whether the form of this, as we've written it, um, is, uh, is appropriate to send to the planning board because it, it doesn't define itself that way. When you send the, an ordinance to the planning board, it has to talk about uh, uh, amending ordinance uh, or code 271, and, and, how, and this doesn't do that. So he can talk about that. I would say um, that I think we ought to stick to the 62 and not go beyond that at this point. I think we ought to learn how to do this before we get, we haven't really discussed going beyond. And I would say, let's not make the, the perfect, you know, something that is, is gonna be harder to attend, uh, attain and it's gonna be a longer period of time. I would suggest to, you, to all of us that we consider passing this and then go back and have some of the conversations that we heard from uh, some of the speakers tonight about how to amend it in the future. But this was really identified as a way to help us, the seniors stay in the community. And I think we ought to stick to that, uh, that target and that goal and move forward with this. Thank you, Mr. Zulu. I'm just, I was going to ask Mr. Desiderio, is this format appropriate for the planning board or would we have to change it? No, we would have to change it, uh, Mr. DeLuca. We would have to do it. And, and then I guess my other question is, if, we, if it's going to be part of the zoning ordinance, would this, be, would, we, would this then have to be listed as an accessory use in those districts where it's permitted? Hmm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, but but the answer to your discreet the discreet answer to your question is no, it is not in an appropriate form. <clears throat> One of the other things that we would have to put in it is that it would have to it's a it's a approval would have to be sent to the to all of the neighboring municipalities and also to the uh, to the county planning board. Uh, so the the uh, we would have to change its uh, its form. Do we know? Do we know? What, well, I'm sure we do know. I apologize. When, when are the next? Plan, when is the next planning board meeting? Next, next week. Tuesday. Next what? Next Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. Fourteen. Um. No, I lost my sense. Where I was going to go. Never mind. Miss Adam. Yeah, I, I, I think part of the context, and I think uh, Mr. Davis alluded to it just for the public's benefit, we always need to be really uh, mindful of um, not just density per se, but character of the town. We've grown um, just in, since I, I've lived here since 1989. Um, population has increased um, to over 25,000 and we're four square miles. So I don't disagree with Mr. DeLuca that I think it's a good idea to, to keep this at 62 for now. I don't have the ordinance in front of me and I can't remember if it if we talk about people with disabilities or not in the ordinance. I don't remember discussing it at all the code meetings as um, potential, uh, you know, someone under 62 years of age with disabilities. That's something I wouldn't mind considering um, but I think it's, you know, the character of the town is very, you know, for single family neighborhoods is, is important to be mindful of, um, for the reasons that Mr. DeLuca stated with regard to his use of frat house. It's basically not quite, you know, we're not really worried about frat houses necessarily, but there is the potential for too many people to be living in ADUs. Um, so I think baby steps with regard to, to that I, are important right now. Um, and um, as was stated, we can revisit it once we start to um, unroll this as, as a, a acceptable thing to do. So those are my uh, comments. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Uh, Mr. Limbrick, any thoughts, comments? I, I don't. I mean, I, I'm. I'd certainly. I'd be inclined to vote for this ordinance uh, as as it is. 
uh, and you know would also be open to you know to expanding it or making changes going forward. But uh, you know I tend to agree with Mr. DeLuca that uh, you know delaying the approval of this ordinance because we think we might be able to improve it going forward, especially if those changes are going to require uh, you know some some significant work and time. Uh, I'd rather not delay. I'd rather approve this, and then we can always, uh, you know, supplement it, uh, amend it later. Uh, you know, and, and I also I, I don't have strong opinions on where this should go to uh, the planning board. I, I would sort of yield to the judgment uh, of of my colleagues, particularly those of you who've served on the planning board, uh, about whether whether there would you know there would be value in sending this to the planning board. Uh, but you know, I I came tonight ready to vote yes on this. Uh, and I thank Mr. Daffis and Mr. DeLuca and Ms. Adams and, and all of the people who've worked on this um, to bring this to fruition. I think this is good. Uh, this is good policy uh, and will help a lot of people. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm prepared to support it, but obviously, um, you know, we'll, we'll yield to others in terms of where this should go to the planning board and uh, and well, you know, whether we may want to make some amendments before we approve it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Lindbergh. Um, Mayor, when I, I, oh, add, Mayor, I'll wait. I, I just want to make it clear, uh, because we, we, we talked very quickly about this and, and, and a lot of people who are listening about this for the very first time are not in the weeds as we are or have been. So we just want to make it clear that this would apply to all single family residences in town uh, and to all kinds of income households. So everybody would be eligible to build one of these uh, ADUs, right? Uh, it's not restricted to a certain part of town and we certainly uh, never uh, would do something like that in terms of the parity and equity issue. Also, uh, if you think about it in terms of uh, providing not only an opportunity for seniors who own a home who can no longer afford the property taxes or on a fixed income, uh, but who could uh, make some rental income and provide housing for someone who would otherwise not be able to afford to live in Maplewood. Uh, because the eight, someone who lives in the ADU doesn't need to be a senior. If the senior is the homeowner who's providing the opportunity for the ADU renter, the ADU renter can be a non-senior. So we want to make that clear. Uh, and that also uh, would afford, would create not just uh, more density, but also more diversity uh, and opportunity for affordable housing in, in this alternate fashion. And I also agree with Mr. DeLuca, um, who you know has a way of putting it always really well. Let's not let the imperfect be the enemy of the good, uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good, and, and, and move forward here and continue having these important conversations with people uh, and seeing how we can expand down the road. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Daffis. Uh, you took one of my points. I just wanted to make sure we were clear that this is, this is across town, regardless of wherever anyone lives. When we pass the ordinance, it's universal. It's from border to border and it's not targeted toward any area in our community. Uh, I just wanna say that, uh, you know, when I read this ordinance, I thought it was solid. And I think it was a good point to let our, um, our residents know who are watching this evening that this wasn't something that was just put together in, in a couple of weeks. I think uh, it's definitely been years. I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. I don't even sit on those committees, but I've, I know I've been privy to some of the conversations. But I do also want to thank Mr. Ward, Mr. Tabby, and Mr. Dunbar uh, for their for their great points tonight. Uh, you know, my response to Mr. Ward, which I'll repeat again right now, is that I think it's a phased approach. I think that we have something here that is uh, is good uh, and it's hard work. Uh, it's something that is moving us in the right direction, but it's a commencement. So I think there's an opportunity to build on top of this ordinance and 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 do more and to address some of the things that were brought up. Uh, and so I'm definitely in, in favor of that. So uh, that those are my thoughts. Um, if there any, are there any more comments? If not, we'll just ask for the. Uh, I'll ask for the. Uh, I think uh, there are some comments. from um, the public on the chat, which is hard to see because of the. I'm not sure we can. We're not, we, we're not supposed to take public comment uh, at right. this point. In the right. Okay. 
Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I was muted. Yes. 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 And thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Thank you, everyone, for your work on the ordinance. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to skip agenda item number 14 because I don't believe of any reports from departments this evening. So we're going to move to agenda item number 15, our administrative reports. Uh, Mr. Malinowski, uh, Mikulowski, you are now uh, up as our township administrator for the evening. Hey, I just have two quick things. Um, I know uh, procedurally you guys usually cancel one of the August meetings. I don't know if Liz needs ample notice and if you want to take care of that now or at the, the other July meeting. Um, and then the other one um, I will share my screen for. Sorry. No worries. And I don't mean to steal anyone's thunder about the pool. If that's in your reports, I'll just be brief. <laughs> um, so I wanted to uh, let you know that the pool opened on July 6th and it went great. Um, Melissa uh, sent over some pictures for everybody. Um, kids camp opened, uh, Funky Fun Art Camp and the Maplewood Tennis Camp. Uh, online pool registration time slots are working great. Um, they're also taking registrations via phone for those who can't do it online. Um, the system is working, the time slots are filled up for the most part, and pool membership is currently at 2,202. Uh, kids camp has children in before care, half day, all day, and after care, totaling 46 campers. Our max is 50. Uh, Funky Fun Art Camp was capped at 20 this week due to the election, and we'll have campers going forward um, to 30. And the Maplewood Tennis Camp has sold out at 24 players. And, and the Maplewood great. Farmers Market is every Monday from two to seven on the corner of Yale and Springfield. <laughs> I love the one cow apart. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, any well, any questions um, for uh, for Glenn? So uh, seeing none, let's go ahead and, and let's go ahead. I'd actually like to have that discussion quickly about the August 18th uh, meeting. Is, is everyone comfortable with canceling that meeting, which we've traditionally done for at least the last previous three years? Yeah, I am. Yes. <laughs> OK, um, can I, <laughs> the crowd's going wild here. Um, <laughs> can, uh, can I receive a motion, please? I move we cancel August 18th. Take a second, please. Second. Awesome. I'm, not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what he said since he froze. So I'm not <laughs> sure what I would be voting on exactly. I'm assuming it's the cancellation of the August 18th meeting. He canceled yes. the meetings for the rest of the year. I just don't want I'm to good with vote yes August, on something, you know. August 18th. My motion was August 18th, cancel. And I, I yeah. seconded that. Yeah. Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Gladly. <laughs> yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Luca. Yes. Bloomberg. Yes. Mayor McGee. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Um, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Michalowski. Uh, now we'll move on to Mr. Desiderio. Uh, Mayor, I have no report. Thank you, Mr. Desiderio. Uh, Ms. Fritzen. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple of things. I want to start off by uh, thanking Mr. Bingley report of uh, yesterday's primary elections in uh, New Jersey, and specifically in. Uh, Maplewood. Um, basically, our three polling locations that we chose and were approved that's the Maplewood Community Center, the Maplewood Municipal Building, and New Woodland. I think we did a great job because we really, really planned, and I think that um, we served the voters, those that did want to go to a polling place, 
and vote um, with, I think, great safety, uh, was taken into consideration. And uh, again, we planned ahead, and I think we got a gold star for everything that we did in this township as far as getting ready for um, voting yesterday. Um, I tried to pre-think anything that could make it easier for a voter that they might have confusion with. So I feel like we uh, did our best as far as signage, uh, literature. I want to thank uh, Glenn and Mr. Davis for all the uh, PR that had been going out for weeks for voters. And um, we, it, it was just the first, the first of the kind of election. And uh, again, on the townships end, and my fellow department heads who helped me greatly because you cannot do this alone. And I thank them all today, as a matter of fact. Uh, we had the residents, um, I think, pretty well served that needed to go to the polls. And um, if there's any questions on yesterday, um, let me know. Otherwise, I have a couple more items. Mayor? Any, any, yeah, I, I did have a question. And you know, this is a question for, for Ms. Fritzen or anyone else who might know. And, and that's, um, you know, one of the things that, that the county did uh, for those of us who were voting by mail uh, and wanted to, to make sure that our ballots were, were you know, secure and certainly received uh, was to provide, I think it was five uh, secure drop boxes around the county. The, the closest one here looked like it was uh, by the, the Cody Arena uh, in West Orange by Turtleback Zoo. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, whether there's, you know, whether Ms. Fritzen, you're aware of any discussion by the county or if anyone else is aware of any discussion to uh, offer more of those for the November election. Obviously, we're anticipating uh, higher voter turnout for the general election in November than than happened uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, you know certainly the, the convenience of of having the box I think you know would encourage uh, people to vote, and uh, we might be able to cut down the number of people who need to vote uh, in person on election day, uh, and make people feel better that uh, rather than trusting the postal service. Uh, where ballots might get lost to actually, you know, sort of uh, put it directly in that box and know that it's going straight to the county. Just wondering if, if there's been any discussion of that yet. Oh, Mr. Lundrick, there was no discussion. And again, we weren't uh, given uh, an opportunity for any, any input as to whether or not we would have a uh, box in Maplewood. And as you can see, a lot of times we do not have their own box. But the uh, clerks of the county have already said, you know, that was a condition if this uh, was a vote by mail uh, election in the future, that every township should have a box in their community. It's just not fair for people that don't even have uh, the means of transportation to get to uh, the closest box. And I think you're correct, being the Cody Arena. Um, so that was a suggestion that was made. Uh, we, as far as the uh, uh, clerks and municipalities made a lot of suggestions, and hopefully someone will be taken into consideration for the future. But, um, you know, there were a lot of things that uh, we were uh, not receiving uh, any communication on, and we did ask for a lot of uh, our ideas to be considered for the future. And uh, again, I so note that I agree with you, and if we could get two boxes in there, I would fight for that as well on uh, strategically uh, locate, uh, locations in, in the community. So I don't have a real answer for you except for any opportunity that I get. And I submitted uh, uh, 15 or 16 comments and questions on behalf of the Township of Maplewood at a, a, a teleconference meeting that we had with the uh, county clerk and the uh, clerk of the Board of Elections. So I think they know um, what we're thinking here in Maplewood to make things better for our residents and our voters. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. When was that? Did you have that call post the election? Pre the election. Yeah. So one of the things that I would like to do, and 
Ms. Viveros gets back is to have a, a typically when we have these events, the uh, we have an emergency management sort of post-mortem and go over this. And we need to do that because I think and I want to compliment uh, Ms. Fritzen for the work. You know, we had our meeting on May 27th to plan for the election. And our goal was to make sure we had the safety of our election poll workers and our voters in mind. And I think we did that. Having said that, there was a lot of confusion that came out of the county about where you could vote. It turns out you could vote anywhere. And they had designated districts in different places than they normally vote. It was a lot of unnecessary work on our behalf. Um, I think the absence, and I spoke to, to Ms. Fritzen about this yesterday, the absence of the ballot box at Maplewood was, was terrible. We should have had one, as Mr. Lembrick says, at, at town hall or maybe in a couple places. And we should that should be something that we convey back. I also think that um, the setups in the three places were done very well. I think we found a few glitches at town hall where people didn't have enough space to fill out their after ballots. Uh, and they amended that a little bit. We brought a table in, but we've got to work on that because the ballots are, you know, it has to be a private uh, transaction when someone's there. It can't be in the middle of everything. So uh, I think we have a few, a few things we have to fix. We have no knowledge at this point whether it's going to be a mail-in or an in-person voting in November. Um, but either way, we have to start getting prepared for both of those possibilities. And if we're going back to every district like we had, we're going to have lines, have to make sure we have it planned out. The sooner we start talking about that, the better. So we'll, we'll do that. We'll start uh, towards the end of July. We'll start uh, going over all this. I agree with that. Big Thank big. you, Mr. Go ahead, Mayor. Sorry. No, go ahead. Pat. Uh, I agree with that, Vic. I, I think under the circumstances, we did really, really well from what I observed, but there was a lot of confusion out there. And, you know, the other point I would bring with the county when we do have a debrief internally first is uh, that a lot of our poll workers who came out to work despite the challenges and the anxiety that we're all experiencing right now, and good for them, a lot of them were not trained. Uh, you know, there, there was one training session, I think maybe two, one of the training sessions was on July 4th, a holiday, in the middle of the day, on that hot Saturday, uh, with a capacity of only 100 persons, and we know there are well over a thousand poll workers throughout the state uh, on election day, so we really need to get that message uh, to them uh, that we got to do that differently, especially if we're going to do this again. This was a good practice run. Uh, I'm really proud of our state that we went nearly all VBM. It was really a hybrid, not pure VBM. I hope we go towards a VBM in the future, uh, but we have a lot of work. Through. There were a lot of glitches. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daffis. Uh, I just want to first and foremost recognize Ms. Fritzen. Yeah. Uh, she was able to, you know, successfully, in my opinion, get this election done with little to no staff. For those who don't know, Ms. Fritzen is working uh, as a one person individual. She was down two people for the bulk of this year. So she was taking on the job of three people theoretically and inclusive of running an election under the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So if there was any flaws or any things that weren't perfect, I say that is what it is because for Ms. Fritzen has been here for 40 plus years and had to deal with this for the first time in her history and being down to only one person, I think we should recognize and applaud her for the tremendous job which she did. So uh, I just wanna state that first and foremost for the record. Secondly, I do agree with my colleagues that the county can do better in this regard. I think the county tried to provide a cookie cutter uh, process, uh, which was not uh, conducive to this municipality and the other 21 as well. So that is feedback which we will have to uh, uh, upstream, if you will, to make sure that's clear. There should be core flexibility at each municipality under this pandemic to be able to make adjustments, such as uh, in terms of voting box, getting voting box access, in terms of where you can actually you know, do your provisional vote 
regardless of what district you happen to be in. Um, so we will take that feedback. Also, I think we need to set up a task uh, force team for Ms. Fritzen in the fall, taking into consideration that this is the general election and a presidential year. So I think that we should work with Ms. Fritzen, a couple of my colleagues should join her into a task force, and then also some department heads to, as Mr. Luca say, prepare for uh, the November election. But those are my comments, and, and thank you, Ms. Fritzen, again. You're welcome. You know, I was just going to say one thing, Mayor. You know, a lot of us are seeing in other states how they're disenfranchising voters, and they're doing it by laws and they're doing it by putting up hurdles. Well, making a system too hard, even when you have allies, also disenfranchises people. And we have to get that message across too. Our allies run the county government. Our allies run the election system. And this is ridiculous that people had such a hard time, uh, or at least it just, it just seemed like it was hard for people and it didn't need to be. And we need to convey that message too. And I totally agree that as we picked it up channel and, and let them know, and there's gotta be more flexibility. They can't, you know, it's not, you know, one solution uh, for, you know, for 22 municipalities, it just cannot happen that way. Um, so I agree with you 100%. Ms. Ritson, yeah, I know you have some more things. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, also, I just wanted to give a report that we continue to uh, receive plenty of applications for uh, the outdoor cafes. Uh, just another one uh, today. And an interesting one that we have never really had uh, an outdoor cafe uh, license for, and that's the Burger King on Springfield Avenue. <laughs> but think about it, they have outdoor dining all the time. And this way that uh, they want to participate so that they can get the uh, uh, the rules and regulations on what they can do and cannot do with their outside diners. So I think it's kind of nifty that they're interested. I heard they have good shakes. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, sidewalk retail, uh, hearing from people at least weekly on that, businesses, and uh, plenty of businesses in the park, mostly uh, drawing studios, uh, uh, the um, music merchants, as well as um, exercise businesses. And uh, we're now uh, have a couple of uh, studios um, that provide music lessons and they're uh, running their program, you've probably seen it, under tents uh, right near the King Square Park. So again, we've been able to keep up with the demand. I brought the fall with me. Uh, the outdoor cafe fall is probably three acres at least. Uh, and with. So um, people are uh, taking advantage of the COVID-19 temporary permits that the township uh, offered um, that were available. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Any more questions for Ms. Fritzen in regards to uh, outdoor dining or our reopening plan for uh, under COVID? Hearing none, uh, thank you, Ms. Griffin. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. We'll now move on in our agenda to uh, agenda item number 16, reports from elected officials. Uh, Mr. Daffis, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I do have a few items. Uh, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, a couple of the items, though, will lead to discussion and ask for formal policy vote from my colleagues. Uh, I'm going to start off with the uh, Maplewood Community Board on Police. We had a great discussion last Wednesday evening, a marathon meeting. Uh, a lot of good stuff came out of that meeting. Uh, I do want to bring to everyone's attention that the voting members of the board, uh, the, the majority has recommended the, that we extend membership by two voting adult members. We're currently at seven. We have an opening of one member. Uh, we have received a fulsome set of new applications uh, just for the one spot that we currently have open. So this would allow the board the opportunity to have more hands on deck at a time when the board's work is more important than ever. Uh, and it would also give us an opportunity to further diversify the board, wh which I think is important. Uh, again, the majority vote was in favor of uh, extending membership. Uh, and uh, I 
I'm gonna open it up for discussion there before I make a motion. Any discussion? Good idea. Yeah, I have no problem with that at all. Terrific. So then I'm gonna move that we extend the membership of Maplewood's Community Board on Police by two adult voting members. Do I have a second, Mr. Lembert? I'll, I will second that, Mr. Deputy Mayor Dapas. So just a procedurally, what we're doing is instructing Mr. Desiderio to draft an ordinance, right? That's right. Because we can't do it. We have to have an ordinance change. Okay. Right, right, right. I just wanted to right. or, 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 you know, or, or amend the existing ordinance, if, if that's the case. But either way, it has to be an ordinance and it has to be two meetings. Right. Yeah. In, in the meantime, yeah. we can interview for the you know potential positions, but we just can't do it by one vote tonight. Right. Correct. Uh, that was going to be my second point, which is uh, starting to schedule the interviews. We do have a nice set of applications uh, at first glance. Mr. And, and Davis, can I can I can we go back just so, for purposes of this? So what we're going to do is we're going to increase from four Maple residents selected from the Maple community, we're gonna make that six. So there'll be six at large members, is that correct? That's right. Okay, just so I understand for purposes of doing it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And should we vote on your motion, Mr. Daffis? Right. Just for the record? Please. Yes. Ms. Fritz. Ms. Fritz, I'd like to call the roll for- uh... Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Blanton? Yes. 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 Mayor yes, thank you, Mr. Ritson. Okay, Minister Daffis, keep going, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and uh, as I, I was about to say that we should probably, we'll work with Glenn to start scheduling interviews for, uh, for the board. The other thing that came up during the, uh, the board meeting on Wednesday night was uh, Maplewood's uh, auxiliary police force or reserves. I'm sure we'll have some discussion about that based on uh, attendance this evening uh, by public comment later. So I will not get into it here. It's not necessary as part of my report. Uh, I wanna move on to uh, outdoor dining. Uh, I wanna talk at the macro level. We have amplified our efforts. Code enforcement and public health have been out there twice a day. We've uh, cited violations. Uh, we've taken away tables where they needed to be taken away. We pushed them apart where they needed to be pushed apart. We made it very clear that public health is our priority, life over profit. Uh, the pedestrian mall in the evening is alleviating sidewalk congestion as we hoped it would, so that's good. And we do have uh, light PD presence uh, in the village in the evening to ensure that residents are being safe, to ensure that alcohol consumption is not what it shouldn't be in areas that shouldn't be rather, uh, and that uh, folks are encouraged to uh, mask up uh, as crowds develop and social distancing is not possible. Uh, on the micro level with outdoor dining, I'm going to ask for your support on an adjustment that we need to make. Uh, we continue making modifications and adjustments to make sure that we're balancing out everybody's needs and everyone's concerns. Uh, Words Bookstore and Coda Restaurant have reached an agreement uh, whereby the parklet that is currently shared by Coda and Wild Ginger will move down two parking spaces towards stationers. Two parking spaces towards stationers. Uh, the reason why this is important in a TC meeting and uh, official policy vote is that the handicapped parking spot that we will be taking up now needs to be swapped for the parking spot in front of words, which will be the new temporary, uh, temporarily striped handicapped parking spot. Words and Coda are both okay with having the handicapped parking spot swiped in this matter. Words is okay with having it in front of their store. So I ask you for your uh, support on that. Is there any discussion? Mr. Davis, does that have um, an ADA accessible ramp to the sidewalk from that spot? It does. Yes. There's a, there's a depression on the crosswalk. Vice and, uh, I was just you know, Mr. Work. Kittner said that that was sufficient to do that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Daffis, I would uh, I would move the move I would move a motion to move the handicapped parking from its current current existence to in front of uh, words. Thank you, Mr. Second. 
Can we call the roll? Perfect. Mr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Baptist? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee. Yes, thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Continue, Mr. Daphnis. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. The next item, uh, still in keeping with outdoor dining, is I, I just want to report, uh, as you're all aware, because I've been keeping everyone informed along the way, our village man manager, Deb Yohannan, is working with our new cultural affairs director, uh, Ana Di Arculeta, uh, who joined us just before the pandemic and hasn't been able to do much, but now she is charged with working with our uh, village manager and with Nicole Wallace, our Springfield Avenue partnership manager, uh, regarding um, outdoor entertainment. A lot of our local artists, musicians, and others are very eager, eager to entertain outdoor diners in the evenings. Uh, they'd love to perform for us. And so uh, Anna and, and Deb and Nicole are working on making uh, busker agreements and figuring out what that's gonna look like. And of course, any agreements that are uh, put together will go through all the appropriate channels, including legal when we get there. We hope to start performances uh, by the end of this month and I'll report back on the status of that uh, as it evolves. Uh, Mr. That, does that also include Ms. Davis and Mr. Osborne who reached out to us? Absolutely. Uh, artist outreach is going, uh, is happening to all the interested parties that we know of as well as other artists in the community as well. Uh, Anna is uh, uh, preparing an artist registry, which I think is a really nice, comprehensive, uniform way to go about this. And uh, like I said, as I have more details, I will share them with everyone. I think it's Thanks. exciting. It's a wonderful idea. Uh, the last item I have is also going to go into uh, a bit of a, a fulsome discussion, if you will. Uh, today, as you're all aware, the governor uh, Governor Murphy announced a requirement, as our public health officer Davenport reported earlier, a requirement for masking up outdoors uh, in areas and circumstances when social distancing is just not practicable. Uh, that means in the parks, during uh, prime hours when a lot of people are out, even if you're going out initially alone, but you're going to come into contact with a lot of people. That means in outdoor dining areas. That means outdoors in a lot of different circumstances. Uh, so the issue of enforcement of, of that executive order is something that we should probably discuss. Uh, I'll give a little bit of context before we head into it here. We have discussed this in code enforcement uh, on prior occasions with every executive order that was passed. Uh, most recently, we discussed it back in April, I want to say, when the essential and non-essential businesses executive orders were being passed down. Uh, and our chief of police, Chief Duvall, and others were alerted that uh, local law enforcement has the exclusive authority to enforce the executive orders. So we want to engage in a discussion tonight to see what is appropriate for Maplewood. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we don't want over-policing of our residents uh, because when we're talking about folks not masking up, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times it's going to be our kids who are out there excited in the warm weather to enjoy recreational opportunities uh, all over town. Uh, and we're, you know, we don't want to police our youth, right? Uh, on the other hand, though, since we have and we were not mandated, mandated to do so. But since we have opened our pools, opened our camps, opened our recreational opportunities, again, we were not required to do that. Uh, we were offered the opportunity to do so and we took it. We do have to uh, alleviate concerns out there from residents, some of them with merit, others without merit, uh, that we are taking the necessary precautions, including having some kind of enforcement uh, procedure in place. So I'm going to open it up uh, for others to chime in. You know, enforcement comes from penalty and it also comes from sort of encouraging people to do things. And I think that given the concern by 
many people in the country about the relationship of the police to the community. I don't think, I would agree with you, I don't think we want more police uh, interacting in these kinds of potential negative ways. Um, I, I believe that what we need to do is to hire some social ambassadors, people who are less about the punishment and more about the encouragement and the reminding uh, that they would walk around with masks and they would walk around with a tape measure if they need to. And they, as they see, you know, things slipping, they can just say, hey, I just want to remind you, stay socially distant if you're lining up for this or uh, if you don't have a mask, here's the mask that you can have. Uh, I think it would be better to have those kinds of uh, people uh, employed by us to go out and, and interact in our parks on the weekends. Uh, and I think that's pretty much what we're talking about. Ms. Adams. Yeah, I would just, um, I, I almost brought this up with Ms. Davenport during the Board of Health. Um, the fact that so many, especially um, preteens or, or tweens or, you know, groups of kids who are together, I see it every single day with, they obviously don't live together. Um, they're doing what that age does and they're close together there. And those are what I'm hearing anyway, and maybe you can um, educate us a little, is that that's where a lot of the spread is coming from is the student, the younger people who are um, being exposed and bringing it home to um, people they live with. Um, and I think, I think we need a real public, a lot of public um, announcements and education to the parents of these kids who are walking, they go out, they finally allowed to get together after being in, in isolation for a couple months, but they're not at all. I'd say a majority of them are not adhering to distancing, clearly not distancing and almost never wearing masks as they walk around getting ice creams or Starbucks or whatever it is. And they're, they're being incredibly irresponsible. So I, I agree with Mr. DeLuca on, on having people out there to educate and so on. But I really, I really have to ask the parents in this community to be talking to your kids and educating them because they're gonna bring it back to you. And it's just been really frustrating to watch, um, not only here, but where I work, to see, you know, eight kids together and none of them physically distancing from each other and none of them wearing masks and thinking it's all okay. And it's enormously dangerous and frustrating. That's my, that's my frustration right now. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Mr. Limbrick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would agree with, with Mr. DeLuca uh, that you know we do have to be sensitive uh, here and, and should be cautious in terms of having officers, uh, you know, being you know you know basically spend uh, in parks and other places where people can and social distance. Uh, and enforcers, uh, you know, especially because um, you, you know we we might achieve compliance, but I I don't think that's uh, really good community relations. Uh, you know, I guess the question I would have while supporting having a sort of who are we proposing would do that? Uh, you know, obviously these are people who we would have to to employ and to pay are we talking about existing township employees from other areas are we talking about hiring new people you know who's going to supervise them how much are they going to be paid you know i think those are all things that that i think it you know, as, as the governing body that we should uh we should be discussing and uh you know on the one hand i know we may not be prepared to do that tonight but on the other um we also don't meet again for a few more weeks uh so i, I guess the those are sort of the questions that I would 
throw out there that, that would take this from, uh, in my view, good in theory to, to something we can implement in practice. Thank you, Mr. Limerick. This is, this is gonna be a collective effort. I, I think that's the bottom line. We have been, uh, I think, very thoughtful and consistent in our messaging, in our, you know, uh, in our uh, parks and other key areas, you know, highly suggesting that residents use facial coverings or masks. Um, yes, the governor uh, passed an order today requiring it um, to have a facial covering or mask and to leverage it when you can't implement social distancing, which is very aligned with what we communicated for well over a month now. Um, we do need this, uh, those social ambassadors. Uh, we need those as soon as possible. Uh, we also need the restaurant owners to work with their management, uh, their um, waiters and, and waitresses and, and members of their staff to say, no mask, no service. Uh, we also need uh, our, our school district to get all those school is out technically to continue to promote that message. We need our community to come together and to work collectively for each other. Uh, we can no longer have the burden of this responsibility uh, you know, on the five individuals on this uh, body of government and also on even on our law enforcement. We need to look out for each other and we need to be responsible and respectful to each other. It is not a heavy lift to have a facial covering or a mask with you at all times. It's just not a heavy lift. It's like a cell phone. We need to have that mindset and we need to adapt that mindset as soon as possible. Now, right now, people are relatively comfortable because they see the numbers. Uh, Ms. Davenport provided some numbers at a slight uptick, but right now we're not having as many as 20 or 30 cases a day like we did back in April and May. But if we keep up on this path, we could theoretically get right back there. And if we want to go back that way, then we should continue the behavior that we're implementing collectively. So I actually, you know, ask um, that our residents, uh, as Ms. Adams said, you know, guardians, parents, loved ones, work with your families collectively and choose to have facial coverings, choose to have a mask. This is, this is a collective effort. This is, you know, this is not gonna be solved by having the police enforce it all the time or code enforcement. This is only gonna be solved if we come together as a community. So I'm asking as your mayor for you to take a step back. We're not taking away your rights, we are asking you to be considerate of all your neighbors and to have facial coverings. That's it. It's just that simple. It's like a cell phone. They're accessible. If they're not accessible, we will work to find you some. We'll get the ambassador to have some. But please, and if people will come to our community, ask them to bring their facial coverings as well. It's the only way this is going to work. Because if we don't do this, what could probably likely happen is we're going to see an uptick. And then we're going to be just like Texas and Florida and California. And I don't think anyone wants that. So we really wanna get back to fully reopening our community and getting back to our schools and getting back to the new normal. And we all have to have to get in the game and abide by this process. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and Mr. DeLuca, uh, the social distancing ambassador concept was something that I had um, suggested a couple of weeks ago. It so happened to be right before your finance committee meeting, what was the result of that meeting in terms of our ability to actually uh, put a few ambassadors together and how we're going to pay for them and this, that, and the other? Were there any details that came from that meeting? Yeah, so um, we uh, uh, in, um, instructed our administrator, Sonia Viveros, to make it happen in the village because we were having the problem in the village. So what they did is they... Um, we're now paying the code enforcement people overtime to work in the evenings and on weekends. And the money from that, the money to cover them is coming from the federal CARES money that is our allocation. So uh, if we were to hire additional social ambassadors to work in our parks, they just to answer Mr. Lembrecht's um, uh, concern or, or questions, they could either be under the responsibility of the recreation department, the health department, the, the division, um, uh, or code. I, I would say that we ought to um, charge the administration uh, to make this happen as sooner rather than later. And they will have the appropriate uh, salary line to pay and all of that. So uh, I think we have experience 
using existing personnel. I think in this instance, we're probably going to have to hire some new people um, and, uh, and then sit down maybe with uh, Ms. Davenport and maybe with the chief of police and figure out the protocol so that when these folks are out there, how they can uh, encourage people to do exactly what the mayor is saying is use your common sense and be respectful of other people and provide the masks, uh, suggest the people that they move a little bit further away, that kind of stuff. So it can be done pretty quickly. All right. So maybe we can have an OEM meeting to sort of put that together as soon as possible. Uh, and Mayor, you're right. This is a social contract, as Ms. Davenport stated earlier. It's a social contract. Let's we all have a stake in this, and we all should come together uh, to protect each other. Thank you, Mr. Davenport. I just want to say one thing just to address uh, Ms. Adams. Uh, it is super difficult um, and frustrating to see uh, the children um, and young adults and their parents <laughs> and a whole bunch of different people going out without face masks, given what we've already gone through. It is it's super hard to think that we might be going back to that. Um, so I completely understand your frustration. I like the idea of telling the kids, you know, no cell phone if you don't put on a mask. Like I think that every parent should do so. Um, I think that'll be very effective as a mother of three, I would say so. I also think that um, Maplewood is about being kind. Um, and I, I have to say that teaching your children to wear face masks or face coverings is the greatest kindness you can teach them because it actually asks you to think of others um, before yourself. And, and if everyone did that, um, it's a great lesson in empathy, and I think this is a great opportunity and a, a teaching and teaching mo teachable moment to do that. If we go with the social and uh, social distancing ambassadors, which I, I really like that idea, um, I would I would love to say that those people have to be healthy models of the same behavior we want to uh, enforce. So they would be people that the the, the residents, but especially the young impressionable um, children, would be looking up to. Um, and I think that could that would work. We have to have them wear a mask you mean Our social, yes. uh, yes. <laughs> you know uh, just on your point if anybody wants to see it melbourne australia that county there just re-quarantined five million people for six weeks wow. because they had 146 cases new cases so that's not what we want Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Mr. Mikulowski, we got this. You got this covered, right? You'll be speaking to uh, Ms. Veros, and we can put something together for next week. Yeah, we'll try and get to a meeting together for Monday if everyone has availability, and then yeah. we can tack that on with the election stuff and take it all. A little. All right. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Mr. Daffis. Anything else, sir? No, Mayor, thank you, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DeLuca. Thank you, Mayor. I got um, five things. Uh, the Maplewood Library reconstruction. Uh, we've submitted an $8.3 million uh, grant request to the state for our $19 million project. Um, the, we hope to uh, hear a decision by early August. Uh, we, I am happy to say that as of five o'clock tonight, we cleared all the Department of Public, uh, Department of Environmental Protection reviews, including uh, water resources, land resources, green acres, and the big one tonight, historic preservation. Um, we were, we were at the tip of having to go to a hearing in August, but after we submitted our documents today. Uh, we got an email at five o'clock saying we're done, so um, we can keep moving forward. So I just just want to keep you up on that, and hopefully in, in August we'll have uh, some good news. Uh, number two, um, and uh, Glenn, if you could put up the slide I sent you. Um, we uh, the the Sustainable Maplewood uh, group the committee has been talking about having more electric charging stations in uh, Maplewood and uh, Mr. Um, Kittner and I and uh, Ms. Woods was we were tasked with going and took, taking a look at a couple of places in town 
We looked at the Indiana Street and Yale Street parking lots on Springfield, the pool parking lot. We looked at the Hilton branch of the library and we looked at um, Donnell Road behind the middle school because of the sensitivity of taking parking spaces in the downtown area. We thought, well, how about we put it there because you have the potential of teachers um, and uh, also people who would go downtown to, to uh, eat and shop. So what I would, and, and what we have up here is the um, uh, pay, to pl pay to plug uh, program. Um, and this is something that uh, is with the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, there's also a program for the, with the, the uh, Board of Public Utilities. And what I would like is if possible tonight, we could get a motion that I would move to authorize the township to apply for charging station grants from both the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities. The um, grant deadline is July 22nd for the DEP. And if we could get uh, a second to that motion and consider it, we can uh, be authorized second. to apply. Second. Okay, Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Mr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Mary yes, thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Okay, uh, number three, I want to give you a report on the Maplewood Arts Council. As with uh, many of us, uh, members of the Arts Council were moved by uh, the social justice and racial justice organizing around the country. And they have been talking, um, we've been having weekly meetings, talk about how we could use the arts to um, be involved in this organizing work. And what is being proposed is a poetry social justice project in which we would uh, profile the work of African-American and black poets, both nationally known and local, um, where we would, with their work that resonates with the issues that we're dealing with today, that speaks to social justice. Uh, the poetry would be put on banners and posters and placed around town. The Arts Council people would be raising the money locally and, um, and doing all that work. So I just wanted to let you all know uh, what's you know, being thought about from an arts perspective too. Um, okay, and speaking of art, uh, today and uh, our new uh, director of the Division of Arts and uh, Culture who started on Monday uh, has already been in many meetings um, today, she joined me in a meeting with the Porch Fest folks. So I want to let you know that um, Porch Fest will be uh, slightly modified. We're looking to preserve the character of Porch Fest, but we also understand that we have to keep the performers and the patrons safe. So we're working on a couple of ideas and um, hopefully, certainly by our next meeting, uh, we'll have uh, be able to, be, to say more about what's the proposal. Um, so cautiously optimistic that something's going to happen. And lastly, the Hilton Neighborhood Association, um, we're going to have our Zoom meeting Thursday night, and the topic is how we're supporting our local businesses. And so if anyone would like to join, uh, you can contact me and I can get you onto the link. And uh, we're going to hear from the partnership and the alliance uh, on some of the steps they are taking and how we can um, support the local businesses. You heard Ms. Fritzen saying how Many of the local businesses are using our public spaces uh, and we'll hear some of that and also some of the other promotional stuff that's being done. And that's what I have. Thank you, Mr. DeLuca. Uh, Ms. Adams. Yes, thank you. Um, we've talked enough about mask wearing, so I won't touch on that at all. Um, but supporting local businesses is important as we know. Um, so I encourage everybody to continue doing that or, or increase your support of our businesses. Um, in case anybody forgot, this year marks the 100th anniversary of uh, women's right to vote being uh, ratified. Um, along with the um, women who are trustees in, on the board of trustees in South Orange, we started working last year along with volunteers from both um, uh, both SIDS and the uh, 
and the Business Improvement District in South Orange as well, um, plus some other volunteers, including former uh, Deputy Mayor Kathy Leventhal um, and our uh, um, assistant, um, I'm losing my mind. No, our, our Director of Recreation, um, Missy, have been, we were meeting for a while, um, coming up with things to do on a monthly basis to celebrate this 100th anniversary for women. Um, and obviously we're waylaid by um, COVID. So uh, we're regrouping to uh, see what we can do. Um, I was going to propose something for our August 18th Township Committee meeting since that's the exact day that it was ratified um, in the constitution for women's right to vote, but um, totally understand that we'd rather not be meeting. Um, so uh, we're gonna brainstorm, we're gonna figure something out and we'll be promoting that. But it's kind of a shame that, you know, a hundred years later, we haven't been able to focus on um, something that um, rather sadly took, was only a hundred years ago, um, even though this country is much older. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to let everybody know that we have not forgotten uh, this 100th anniversary and we will be coming up with something that will probably end up being some sort of virtual celebration. Um, and uh, we had something in January and in February and uh, the very beginning of March and then we all got shut down. So, um, but that's uh, also, I, um, I will save this for the Columbus uh, conversation. Um, mostly, but I did meet with the Conservancy um, and I want to relay back to uh, my colleagues here um, when we discuss that discussion item on, on what they said. So that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Uh, Mr. Limbrick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have just a few items. Uh, you know, first, I'd just like to echo what some of my colleagues said earlier, and that's to, uh, to thank and recognize Liz Fritzton and also all of the department heads and township employees for their tremendous work, uh, both yesterday on election day and also for the, uh, for the days and weeks leading up to election day. This was a uh, tremendous challenge uh, under difficult and unprecedented circumstances. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I think we, we, we learned a lot through this process and you know, hopefully we'll be able to get some of the improvements and enhancements uh, from the county that, that we've all agreed that, that we need uh, to make sure that, uh, that uh, in the fall. Uh, second, uh, you know, just to, to follow up on some of the comments uh, that we made earlier regarding mask wearing and social distancing, you know, it's just, you know, I think, you know, no executive order, no enforcement uh, that we can, uh, can implement you know, can replace common sense and common decency. And I think, you know, that's really what we have to emphasize that, you know, we're, we're in this together as a community and we need people to use common sense and common decency and, and recognize that, um, you know, not wearing a mask uh, isn't tough. You're not making a political statement. Uh, you know, you're, you're just being, uh, you're just being rude. Uh, to, to the people around you and putting people in, in danger. Um, as Mr. Mikulowski mentioned, uh, the pool is open. Uh, membership is also still open, still available. Uh, you know, we have 2,200 uh, members signed up, uh, but that's obviously far below what we have in a typical summer. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, things are so far so good, so folks, who may have been waiting to see whether the pool actually opened or, or whether the, uh, the opening was going to be successful. Uh, things are going smoothly. Uh, and I would encourage folks to, uh, to sign up and take advantage of that. Um, finally, I, I wanna just sort of give, uh, you know, some feedback uh, to, you know, to the township committee, you know, based on recent meetings uh, from the public safety committee, from the community board on police, uh, Deputy Mayor Dapis already uh, covered some of this, so I, I don't want to retread that ground. Uh, but I just want to assure the public that we are uh, 
considering the community's questions and suggestions. Uh, and obviously this is a time of, uh, you know, where there's a lot of public attention, uh, both nationally and locally uh, on policing, on law enforcement, um, and that, uh, you know, I, I, I I, I'm speaking only for myself, but I don't think I speak only for myself when I when I say that I'm uh, very open to considering uh, these proposals, looking at at policies that may have been in place for a long time, and thinking about ways we can do better. And I think that we have uh, a chief and a command staff uh, over at 1618 Springfield Avenue at police headquarters uh, who are also very open uh, to these discussions. Um, just three areas that I wanted to highlight that we've been looking at. Um, you know, we've been looking at internal affairs uh, and particularly what information can be released uh, about past incidents, past incidences uh, and discipline of officers. And, and there's uh, state guidance on that. And I think more, um, more clarification uh, on that to come. Um, but, but I think an important point about this, uh, about you know, releasing IA information, uh, is that accountability is not disrespect. Uh, we can and do uh, appreciate uh, the work that our police officers do uh, and also demand that they be held to high professional standards. Um, and you know, I think there, there are improvements we can make uh, to the process. There's, uh, you know, and, and there, you know, some of that's going to require uh, action outside of Maplewood, statewide action uh, and changes in law. Uh, and I think we can be a part of advocating for that. Um, the second point I wanted to address is we've, we've obviously received questions uh, from the community about our police auxiliary group. Uh, Deputy Mayor Daffis mentioned that as well, uh, you know, many people, uh, you know, in town are, are not even aware that we have a police auxiliary. Uh, it's a group of local resident volunteers uh, who, uh, you know, who receive training and uh, get certified to provide support to our, our local police department, particularly during special events. Uh, the, the service they provide um, you know, it, it supplements the police. It doesn't supplant uh, our full-time police. Um, and oftentimes the work that they're doing uh, is, uh, you, know, is uh, you know, either saves the township money uh, by reducing the amount of overtime we might need, you know, requiring uh, fewer officers, uh, on-duty officers to, uh, to staff major events like parades, uh, and also does uh, work, uh, particularly on weekends, uh, that otherwise wouldn't get done. You know, for example, uh, helping uh, at crosswalks near churches and, and religious institutions uh, to, to keep people safe as they're going uh, to and from services. Uh, but we're, we're looking at that program uh, and we're considering potential reforms. Um, you know, one of the ones that I've, I've already uh, discussed uh, with the chief of both the police auxiliary and uh, chief of all of Maplewood police uh, would be providing body cameras uh, for the auxiliary police while they're on duty, you know, particularly uh, while they're while, while they're armed and on duty. And that's something, um, you know, that I, I saw we had a question uh, about whether the police auxiliary are armed, you know, they they, they go through a police academy, they go through firearms training, they have to be certified uh, twice a year in firearms and they, they are armed while on duty. Um, and, you know, but presently, uh, you know, they're not required to wear body cams uh, the way that our full-time uh, officers are while on patrol. And that's something that, you know, that I think we should address uh, immediately. And that's not saying that we shouldn't consider other reforms as well, but I think that's something that we can and should address quickly. Uh, the last thing uh, that I wanted to just say is that, you know, that at least I am open to considering uh, other long-term policy changes with respect to law enforcement in our community, uh, including suggestions that we 
uh, try to divert responses uh, to certain calls from police to other professional responders, such as social workers. I think uh, some of this is going to require change at the state level, uh, but I think these are uh, things that we can investigate here at the local level, uh, see what, um, what authority we might have to make those changes, uh, what resources we may have uh, to make those changes happen, uh, and, and start some of those so start some of that dialogue, um, you know, whether it's changes that we can actually implement ourselves or whether it's changes that we'll have to advocate for at the state level, I think is to be determined. Uh, but I think those are discussions that we can and should start having. And, and uh, again, speaking for myself, uh, as a member of the Township Committee, as a liaison to the Community Board on Police and as the chair of the Public Safety Committee, you know, those are conversations that I'm open to having uh, and welcome uh, the community, which, uh, you know, is showing a lot of interest in these issues to continue having. And Mr. Mayor, that is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindbergh. Uh, I have a few items. First, I'd like to recognize uh, Barbara Velasquez uh, for the Elijah McLean service we had this past weekend. I'd like to thank Ms. Adams who joined me uh, in the service. It was, it was moving. Uh, it was it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It was a tremendous turnout on the North Field of Memorial Park, and really celebrated the life of an amazing, amazing human being who was tragically and senselessly murdered uh, in the Aurora, Colorado area. I also like to recognize um, the owners of HLS, a Black-owned business, for their efforts in Heroes for Heroes. In the last six weeks. They've provided 500 plus meals uh, with a, a price tag of well over $5,000 uh, for all of our first responders, even under this current climate, um, you know, under, under COVID-19, uh, they went above and beyond. And I just think that when we talk about black owned businesses like Top Hat and Tails and City Workshop and Palmer's Cafe and so many others that are located on Springfield Avenue, as well as in the village, I just want to give them a shout out and just say support HLS. Uh, I also like to recognize Karen Wellman and her team. Um, you know, again, as we talked about a couple of times for the summer food program, uh, it was wonderful to see them out there so early this morning and really helping, uh, you know, families, deserving families. You know, uh, my volunteering was more talk than anything this time. I'm used to lifting groceries at OLS, but this was an amazing thing to see. And I just want to recognize the work of the team out there. It was humid, but they were working. They were you know, distributing food as well as books and masks. They were giving out masks. So uh, bravo to that whole team for their efforts. Uh, I also wanted to just formally recognize how we discussed it, uh, uh, Mr. Osborne and Ms. Davis for proactively reaching out uh, to provide music in addition to entertainment uh, in our uh, business districts, special improvement districts. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I look forward to our, our new department uh, head um, to do a great job of setting up that, that program and making sure that it's at the gazebo as well as uh, Yale Corner in addition to um, the village. Um, in regards to uh, some of the uh, requests uh, from uh, the Mapsville Youth Coalition around Juneteenth, I want to I first want to recognize uh, that I've seen them and I want to recognize uh, that some of them I'm in favor of them right away. I've already had preliminary conversations uh, with Sheena Collum, my colleague in South Orange, about doing something about making Juneteenth uh, an official holiday and doing a cross program with the 4th of July. And we're, we're not even there yet because our 4th of July celebration, uh, you know, is very, um, complicated in more reasons than one, and I won't go into that at this time, but just understand that we hear you and we will do something for Juneteenth. Uh, I am in favor of making an official township holiday. Uh, that's as far as I think we can go, um, but I would also take that up to uh, my colleagues across Essex County to make it an official holiday as well. Many corporations did it this year and I expect them to do it next year as well, so I don't see this as being something of an issue. I just think it's just going to take some time to get there. Um, so that is that is my commitment to you regarding Juneteenth and the 4th of July, that we will rethink it moving forward and do something 
uh, along the lines that really celebrates Juneteenth and also um, brings more of a multicultural celebration uh, to the 4th of July from some of the traditional things we've done. Um, in regards to some of the uh, um, demands, if you will, regarding uh, you know, our police force, such as uh, disarming our volunteer police force, Mr. Lindbergh has uh, provided great detail. Uh, we are going to discuss this. Uh, you know, these, these were communicated to us four days ago, just four days ago. It's been four days. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we are moving forward, recognize them. But again, I just want to make sure I'm, the public was clear, you know, it's four days. Uh, so we will, we will continue to explore these things. We will look at these things. We will be thoughtful. We will get all the parties involved, um, you know, from all facets so we can collectively collect all the information and make some decisions uh, that uh, align with what's in the best interest of, of all of our community. I also want to take a second to congrat, uh, congratulate uh, Mr. DeLuca and um, Mr. Daphis, uh, hopefully on their, uh, their re-election, uh, <laughs> or at least winning the primary, I should say. You know, um, that was a tough race, really, really tough. Really, really Lots tough. Of door to door campaigning. And <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as we sit here uh, at 1010 and been meeting for, you know, almost three hours now, and we do this now every other, at least twice um, a month. And, you know, when you take into consideration that, you know, most of us have full time jobs and we spend between, you know, 25 to 30 hours doing this job with the people on top of those jobs. This is a great sacrifice. Uh, we're, we're humbled and we appreciate the honor and it is honor, but it's a great sacrifice. Uh, and uh, for Mr. Daffis and Mr. DeLuca willing to put their hat in the ring again and, and continue this service, I salute you both and, uh, and thank you. Um, and speaking of service, uh, Maplewood resident uh, and post office worker of 30, of, of 30 years, I wanna salute uh, Art Jones, Arthur Jones. Uh, Arthur Jones, like I said, um, you know, he lives here in Maplewood, he worked for the post office and after 30 years he retired. And for many of those on his route, he left us a note and I'm gonna read it. Uh, it says, it gives me great pleasure to make this final delivery to you. I hope I've served you in the community well while delivering mail in this town. After more than 30 years of making my appointed rounds, Today, I hang up my satchel and look forward to retirement in a life of leisure. It's been a great joy meeting you and your family. Mailman out. Wow. And that's Arthur Jones. God bless you, Arthur Jones. He's been a great mailman to me and my family. I'm sure to many residents in Maplewood. So uh, we're glad you're still with us uh, in, your, uh, in, your, uh, in your retirement and your life of leisure. And we wish you and your family nothing but the best. And finally, uh, my last uh, part of my report is just based off the last uh, couple of meetings and couple of months, uh, I will be working proactively to get us back in town hall on August 4th. So I'm just telling you guys that right now. So well, we'll be, and I'm getting cheers from here. So uh, look, look for us to move back to town hall on August 4th. No, Thank no, no. Oh. Let's wait till oh. September. Yeah. I don't know. No, this this technology is not working uh, the way it should. It's not. I don't know. We get a lot more engagement through Zoom meetings. We never have thirty four people coming to our meeting. Well, that, that is this. Well, since we're going to talk about change in Memorial Park, it's, there could be change in our meetings too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. We'll now move on to agenda item number seventeen, our discussion item, which is the uh, Columbus uh, uh, Monument in Memorial Park. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll tee this one off. Um, so it was brought to our attention uh, that there is a, uh, a monument um, regarding Christopher Columbus in our, in our park. Uh, you know, there is a narrative uh, about, uh, about Christopher Columbus and, uh, you know, and an historical narrative and then more of a, uh, another narrative. And so um, th this discussion is about uh, the, the, potential possibility of removing uh, this, uh, this monument, if you will. And I, and I do agree with what Mr., uh, I think it was Mr. Ward said to, uh, if we were to decide to remove this, uh, to remove it, to 
put a new monument in its place, but I would open it up to the public and let the public kind of figure out what that should be that would be more aligned with uh, the culture of our community. But I know Ms. Adams has had some conversation which she alluded to, and I'd like to give her the floor to provide a little bit of uh, insight uh, regarding her conversation. So Ms. Adams. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. Um, thank you. I uh, met with the Conservancy, uh, Maplewood Memorial Park Conservancy Board, who has sort of uh, jurisdiction, if you will, over the park. Uh, we need, uh, it's good that we're having this discussion now, but we do need to get input from not only the Conservancy, but also um, the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and then any application to remove uh, anything in the park that's there as um, uh, whether it's landscaping or changing anything needs to go, Historic Preservation Commission needs to approve it. And then it, we need to make an application to State Historic Preservation Office or SHPO as we all know and love it. Um, so that said, that's just a process. That doesn't mean we can't um, make the decision to remove uh, the Columbus Monument. It's really more of a plaque on a rock um, be, and, and kind of uh, some overgrown landscaping around it. Um, so the Conservancy has no uh, issue with its removal. They do want to make sure that the boulder and shrubs, which are considered contributory to Memorial Park remain. Um, the plaque can be removed. Um, and then as, as you just stated, possibly um, replaced with something else. Um, so I already uh, emailed the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission and it'll be on for their discussion um, at their next meeting as well. Um, there is also in uh, that meeting, it was brought up that maybe there could be uh, something to consider rather, not just with this, but when we talk about removing things is using this as a teaching moment. Um, sort of add additional language or additional information by um, a monument or a plaque or whatever it is to explain what the history of that is and why um, something that was acceptable a couple hundred years ago is no longer acceptable. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as opposed to, um, you know, tearing, necessarily taking everything down. I know uh, Rutgers is, um, not planning on changing the name of Rutgers. Um, and uh, there's just, I think a lot of these things are incredibly complicated to start talking about. Um, and we need to have these discussions. I think it's important to do. Um, it's interesting when I was uh, looking back on some of the history of Columbus, um, this was very much, um, as someone mentioned earlier, I think, um, and, a, and a, a movement um, for Italian Americans to be accepted. But prior to that, the colonists wanted to, even though um, John Cabot was the um, discovered America first, he's kind of forgotten. Um, he was Italian, but he was also English. Um, he was also uh, from what we were trying to escape. So the colonists like really wanted somebody who discovered America that didn't have anything to do with the, the king and, the, and, and England that we were trying to um, be released from. So there's, there's just a lot of levels of everything that go on. And um, so I'm in favor of taking down the plaque for Columbus personally. So, um, but I just want to make everybody aware that we do have to um, go through some processes because it is in a uh, historically designated park in our town, that we have to respect those processes. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Uh, anyone else like to speak on this? I, I would, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I, I concur uh, with some who've spoken earlier and with Ms. Adams that uh, my personal feeling is that I'll vote to take whatever steps are necessary to remove uh, the plaque. Uh, from Memorial Park. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, to be honest, until we were recently made aware of it, for all the time I've spent in Memorial Park, I'd never noticed it. 
Uh, I, I think it's pretty uh, sort of overgrown and, and neglected. Uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, to, to be honest, I think, you know, most of us didn't notice it or, or this, uh, you know, this might have already been proposed and, and done. Um, you know, I, I um, you know, I think that, you know, Columbus's, uh, you know, you know, in terms of any sort of contribution to to this country, it's really much more mythological than, than based on any sort of historical fact. Uh, and, you know, at this point, um, you know, removing the removing any sort of monument to him, um, you know, there's really nothing about his achievements uh, that I think is, is worthy of much vindication. There's a lot about, uh, you know, his life and certainly his legacy that's worthy of vilification. Um, you know, and, and having, you know, particularly over the last 18 years of my life, spent a lot of time working with Native American communities, uh, you know, especially in South Dakota, but in other places in the country. Uh, you know, the, the year 1492 that a lot of us learned, you know, as part of a rhyming poem in, in elementary school, uh, you know, Columbus sailing the ocean blue, Nina Pinta Santa Maria, you know, they really see 1492, uh, you know, very differently. You know, the, the start of over 500 years uh, of, of suffering, of colonization, um, and uh, oppression, death. Uh, you know, so when we consider you know, that, that Columbus's legacy is, is really, um, you know, as a, as a slave trader, uh, as, as an oppressor of, of indigenous communities, you know, I, I think those things are, you know, are not what we want to celebrate. Uh, and I would be in favor of, of taking down uh, this monument as a lot of other communities uh, have already done or are in the process of doing. Uh, you know, I, I would say, not that anyone has asked me, but I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and opine on this anyway, that, you know, as a proud graduate of Columbia University, uh, you know, and as, as someone who, uh, you know, was, is looking forward to sending my daughter to Columbia High School uh, in a few years, you know, I, I do think there is, in my mind, a, a significant difference between memorials or, or monuments specifically honoring Christopher Columbus and the word Columbia, you know, while the word Columbia may have, you know, sort of derived from Columbus, I think that Columbia has come to, uh, to symbolize America, symbolize the nation, uh, particularly after uh, our independence. Uh, and whether it's in the District of Columbia or Columbia University, uh, you know, or, or any number of ways that, uh, that we uh, have Columbia as a word in our society, you know, I feel differently about, uh, about that. Uh, so, you know, I'm all in favor of removing Columbus and Christopher Columbus, I guess, you know, not that it's under our purview, but I, I would feel differently, uh, you know, to the extent people made the proposal um, to, you uh, to change, uh, change Columbia High School, for example. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, that's that's where I'm at on this. You know, and I, I think we should start the process tonight or as soon as possible. Uh, I know from what Ms. Adams laid out that there is uh, a number of steps we have to take, uh, but I, I think we should we should do that, of course. But I, I think we should we should get the ball rolling. Mr. Mr. Lumber, that was. Columbia University was King's College, right, originally? Yes. So King King George that we all just watched. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it was it, yes, it was it was it was named well it was it was a charter from I believe the king before him actually uh, but it was uh, uh, you know it was originally chartered by the king of England and then was changed uh, to Columbia University or Columbia College uh, later uh, to sort of, uh, re you know, sort of both get rid of the king's name, but also uh, celebrate the, the nation's independence. Thank you, Mr. Limerick. That's very good. Um, anyone else like to speak on this uh, subject? Yeah, I would like to say um, I'm in favor of removing it 
Uh, I understand there's a process. I think that we should instruct tonight, Mr. Mikulowski to um, have the DPW come up with a way to respectfully cover it until we can remove it um, without harming it and harming anything around it. Because if we think it's offensive now and inappropriate now, we should do something about it now and not wait for the process because the process is going to take a long time. Um, because the state workers are on, I just, I just went through this with the DEP in the library. So the state workers are going on furlough. Things are not happening that fast. So um, I would su suggest they figure out a way to cover it right now, if that's our intention. And that uh, if once we do that, then we can notify both the Conservancy and the Historic Preservation that we want to remove it, begin that process and tell them that we covered it uh, um, in the interim period. Uh, you know, I, I, as an Italian American white male, um, people say, well, how could you do this? Or why would you do this? And um, I think it is appropriate to understand that not all history is good history and appropriate history. Uh, and I was struck by an interview of Lonnie Bunch, who is a New Jerseyan. Uh, he's the secretary of the Smithsonian. Um, and he's also the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And Mr. Bunch says um, that as, as was talked about here, you wanna use these removals or these statues or monuments or any kind of remembrance as a teachable moment. And he says that removing the statues is not, not about erasing history. History is history, but it is about finding a more accurate history. And that there, he says there's nothing wrong with a country that recognizes that it is, it, its identity needs to evolve over time. We're learning things now that are putting the past and what we honored in the past in a different light. And if you take it away from Columbus or uh, anybody else, just think about Bill Cosby, who at one point had his name on everything, on Jell-O. And then we found out that it was not any longer appropriate to have Bill Cosby doing that. And we moved away. We He's, history will always have his picture on the jello box, but we evolved and understood that the things that he's accused of and convicted of are inappropriate to remember through a monument. So um, our identity is evolving. Our, our history is being broadened. Uh, we talked before, Ms. Adams talked before about uh, the recognition of women, 100 years of voting. How many statues in this country are of women. You could probably count on two hands at most, and they'd be multiple people. So um, I think we should do this. I think it's uh, appropriate. I used to teach history. It's appropriate to remember that history is about studying the past and interpreting the past. And your today and your reflection of today helps you interpret the past. It's not a, you know, it's not a, a, things, things evolve, things are better interpreted now than in the past. And for those things that we have to change, we need to change and we need to remember this history and teach everyone why we are doing it. I think just erasing it would be the wrong thing. And so if we're gonna put something there, we, and if we're gonna talk about this, we ought to put it into a broader statement of why we're doing this. And I'll stop right there. Thank you, Mr. DeLuca. Uh, Mr. Daffis. What is there left to say after the eloquence of Mr. DeLuca? Absolutely nothing. 100%, I support our taking measures to remove it following the appropriate channels. Yes, cover it, send the message for now until we can have it removed and educate, educate, educate. Thank you, yes. May I get a motion? May I get a motion to uh, to remove the um, Columbus Monument from Memorial Park? So moved. Second. Perfect. Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Deluca. Yes. Mr. Lembert. Yes. Mayor McGee. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. 
We're now so, on. So, so Mr. Mayor, just to clarify, so the next step will be for Mr. Mikulowski to work with the DPW and also for maybe Ms. Adams as the liaison to uh, to sort of start the process with historic preservation. Is Are those the, those sort of the, the two steps we take? Yes and yes. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're now moving to agenda item number 18, the consent agenda. Can I get a motion, please? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move that we adopt items one through 16 on the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams. Yes. Ms. Davis. Yes. Beluga. Yes. Mr. Lembrick. Yes. Mayor McGee. Yes, thank you, Ms. Fritzen. We are now on agenda item number 19, our public second public comment, any subject matter. Um, uh, let's see. All right. uh, Glenn, we're ready. We've got uh, quite a few, so I'll start from the top. Uh, Stephen Shakora, um, you're uh, free to unmute. Stephen, are you there? I'm assuming. Um, I just wanted to thank you um, for removing the statue, for answering my emails. I just wanted to thank you guys. I would have never thought this would happen and for motioning to remove it and hide it on that stuff. I just wanted to say thank you very much. That was it. Thank you so much, you guys. Great. Thank you, Mr. Shakur. And uh, our, our um, town clerk, Ms. Fritzen, is asking for your address. Um, so, it, yeah, so Glenn, we got to get name and address. And we, we can get Ms. Uh, Mr. Shakur's address, too. She's taking that for the record. Gotcha. Yeah, Mr. Shakur, if you could do that in the chat or um, via email, that'd be great. OK. And uh, OK. Joan Crystal, um, you can unmute. Thank you. Yeah, John uh, Four Quarter Avenue, Maplewood. I'd like to just point out that the ordinance on ADU specifies R14, R15, and R17 neighborhoods and R24 neighborhoods. It does not include the R12s or the R13s, which are the lower income neighborhoods with the smaller lots. And yet I heard the Township Committee mentioned just now that the intention was to have the ADU available for the entire town from border to border, but that's not what the ordinance currently says. Mr. Desideri, would you like to address Ms. Crystal, please? Roger, are you there? Sorry. I'm sorry. I guess I was on mute. I'll go back and look at the at the uh, at the uh, zoning ordinance. I don't think there is an R12 and an R13 zone. Uh, if there is, that was that was an error on our part. It wasn't an intention to to do that. But I'm I, only familiar I, with the with I'm only familiar with the zones that are in that ordinance, Mr. Deluca, so I have am I wrong? I have the ordinance in front of me. So 271-70. Residential single right. family, R17, R15, R14, and then R24. Right. That, was my that was my understanding. I didn't think those, the, 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 there was any other zones that, that, that were there. They're not. To residential. Okay. That's correct. That's what I thought. Okay. So, we are, so, so the ordinance as drafted is correct, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Desiderio. And there's your answer, Ms. Crystal, and thank you for your comment. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else like to address the Township Committee? Hi, yes, this is Heather Craven. I live on uh, Highland Place. And uh, I'd like to thank the committee for uh, looking at issues to do with the auxiliary police. Um, as you know, the uh, community is really concerned about issues of uh, transparency, accountability, and community oversight. 
and uh, body cameras sound like a really great step in that direction. Uh, I'd like to urge the committee also to really strongly consider uh, disarming the, uh, the volunteer auxiliary officers. Um, as you say, the, uh, these officers are brought in uh, for uh, community events, for things like uh, traffic control. Um, there really should be no need for weapons for those kinds of activities. Uh, we certainly don't want weapons ever used on uh, members of our community. Um, and this is something that uh, the committee has, uh, it sounds like has fairly um, direct control over. Uh, that we know there are a lot of policing issues that are determined uh, by the state or by the police unions uh, that, it's, that it's really difficult to, to have any authority over. Um, but this is something uh, that it, it sounds like the, the committee really can do, uh, has some power to, to take some control and uh, uh, really protect the safety of our community by taking that step. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for staying up. <laughs> Would anyone else like to address the Township Committee? Yeah, I've got about uh, seven more. Hold on. V Vanessa Parvin, uh, you're free to unmute. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to echo the same concerns that Heather has. Oh, I'm uh, 99 Telton, right around the corner from Mr. DeLuca. Hi. Um, and I didn't know about the auxiliary police force until just recently. Um, I like the idea of having extra help when it comes to making sure our community members are safe for parades and nice sounding things like helping in crosswalks near churches. And to me, it doesn't make any sense that there would need to be weapons involved in any of that. Um, body cams might be useful, but I would say disarming them would be a, a top priority for me. And uh, my husband has also given me license to speak for him. I also wanted to weigh in in support of um, thanking you for taking the Columbus Memorial down. And I wanted to weigh in on uh, what um, uh, Mr. Lembrick was saying as far as names. Uh, I would also like to suggest that there be some consideration uh, as far as renaming Columbia and Jefferson. Um, the, the institutions are still the same, no matter what name they have. Um, I feel this on a deep personal level because my child just changed their name. So I think that if the names and the historical figures associated with the names can cause pain and harm to people in our community, then those names don't need to continue and we can make movements to, um, to be more inclusive on that level. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Parvin. Axel, you, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Uh, you know, the that, that's all right. My name is Axel Takach, and I'm a resident um, in the Hilton neighborhood, 182 Franklin. And I'm glad that the issue of the volunteer auxiliary police force was already raised because I'm concerned by it, um, by the use of volunteer officers by the township. I have lots of questions. I hope that these questions can be answered in future meetings and also at the public safety meeting. I want to know, you know what the purpose is, accountability and oversight. Do they have the same legal protections as paid officers? Um, do they have? Do, do they always have the same uh, police powers of arrest, uh, even when they're off duty, say going about their business during the day? But I'm also most alarmed by the fact that they function with those same powers and authority as regular members of the police department, including carrying a firearms and power of arrest. Um, so if there's police force, the auxiliary volunteer police force is primarily used for managing and assisting at community events festivals, city gatherings, crosswalks, um, busy times, do we really need them to have guns with them at those events when really those events are for safe, pay playful and welcoming space for say our children and community members. So I really wanna see the community, the auxiliary police force disarmed if and used primarily for traffic and crowd control if that's what they're used for. I see no reason to keep them armed for those purposes. There's also reasons for disarming volunteer police officers, perhaps not locally, but nationwide, such as the well-known stories of how community volunteers like George Zimmerman harmed and killed young black people. Um, arming volunteer police officers is highly unusual and actually atypical nationwide. And so I see no reason why Maplewood needs to be the exception. Uh, you can ask for evidence of how armed volunteer officers have harmed police, harmed people in Maplewood, but we simply don't know since that information isn't accessible to the public, or if it is, you can correct me. In any case, why wait for a lethal or violent incident to occur before disarming? We know disarming them now 
will prevent a possible lethal or violent incident in the future. So we should do it now. Why wait for tragedy to change policy? So I do support Maplewood looking into alternatives to policing in which volunteers may be trained. Members of our community could be trained to respond to mental health issues, situations involving those experiencing homelessness, respond to noise complaints, respond to drug and alcohol abuse, respond to other atypical behavior at parks and recreational sites and other urgent but non-life-threatening situations. So in short, I hope that the township and the public safety community meeting next week can discuss disarming or, or even disbanding the auxiliary police force and we can reimagine something more restorative and transformative. So rather than being among the nation's exceptions by arming our volunteer force, Maplewood could in fact be an example for how other towns and cities across the nation can create a volunteer community-led group of neighbors seeking the well-being and flourishing of all, not in constant watch of suspicious activity. And so I hope this can be made an explicit agenda item in future meetings and especially at the public safety meeting next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Takakis. Takach. <laughs> All right, uh, Sage Torito. Hi, um, uh, I'm gonna hang up one sec, sorry. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, so I just wanna echo what the person before me said that um, body cameras are not effective and we really need to disarm um, this auxiliary police force. Um, oh, sorry, 6 Wellesley Road. And I'm also <laughs> a representative of MAPSO Youth Coalition. And so I wanna thank you for acknowledging our demands. Um, and I understand it's only been four days, but I, I really hope that you'll um, make sure to acknowledge them all equally, because I know it's super easy to make Juneteenth a holiday. It's a lot harder to realloc reallocate police funds, but we need to be doing all those things, right? Um, so I, I really think that um, you need to look at all of these demands with, with equal respect. And, and I'm really happy to see that a lot of people agree with the demand to disarm the auxiliary police. Thank you. And, and thank you for your comments, Mr. Creek. And the answer to that question is yes. I just, uh, you know, I didn't want to read off all nine uh, on my list there, but we will look at the, all of them. And in fact, I started reading the case uh, between uh, uh, Newark uh, and, the, uh, the, and, the, and the police. It's a quite lengthy document. So I like to read before I uh, make a statement, uh, but it is noted uh, and we will look at all of them. So they're all going to be looked at equally. There were just some that were just kind of low-hanging fruit, if you will, and I could address immediately. But rest assured, we'll look at all of them collectively as, as a body. Thank you. Thank you. What, what was the document that was just being referenced? I'm, I'm sorry, either either the speaker or maybe the mayor could enlighten me. Um, I'm not sure if you mean the document that the mayor was talking about, but... So we have a list of demands, um, MAPSO Youth Coalition. I'll send the link to them in the chat right now. Um, but one of the documents that he was possibly referencing is one relating to um, a specific um, uh, it's, it's uh, the, case. case. It's the, uh, the quote unquote, declare formal support of the city of Newark in the New Jersey Supreme Court case of Returnal Order of Police Newark Lodge, number 12 versus the city of Newark. Um, and that is the case. The so. Civilian Review Board case that's currently being uh... correct. The Supreme Court is about to issue a decision on that. We're waiting any day now. Their term is about to expire. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks. I, I just I wasn't sure what was being. It, it was clear the mayor knew it was being referenced, but I didn't. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. We. I never. Just to, for the record, uh, and please note this. I don't, and my colleagues ever formally received a email with these um, demands or wishes. I pulled these off of, off of a media site for my own edification. So, uh, um, please feel free to formally send them to uh, our township address. But I already have a copy, but just duly note that. Yeah, we're going to send it formally. Thank you. Thank you. Gwen, who's next? Uh, Ronnie Schwartz. Hi, um, thanks so much for um, for acknowledging all of our comments and for um, I, I'm really just very impressed with uh, with the meeting. 
Um, like others who have spoken uh, immediately before me, I too am very concerned that our auxiliary police force is armed, um, even more disturbed that they don't have body cams. And I think that we really need to um, take a look at disarming them. I don't, I don't think there's a need to um, have them uh, carry weapons, particularly as others have said, with the, um, the types of work that they're doing alongside of our regular police force. Um, I particularly wanted to echo the comments um, that Axel uh, Takech made um, concerning all of the questions he asked and um, want to, sorry, I, I didn't note my address is 81 Tuscan Road in Maplewood. Um, but I, I just wanted to um, speak up and, um, and really offer my perspective as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Khadija White. Are you there, Khadija? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yep, there you are. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk and address the Township Committee. Um, after an All Lives Matter and Thin Blue Line flag was recently posted in front of the home of a Maplewood volunteer police officer in my neighborhood on a block full of Black Lives Matter signs, I've learned a lot more about the auxiliary police force. Um, I was surprised like the folks who came before me to learn that this group of community volunteers carries guns that the township gives to them um, or that they're just permitted to carry. Um, I'd like to know why in light of our small town already having over 60 full-time officers that the township committee is continuing to distribute life-threatening weapons to people that according to Deputy Chief Sally are primarily used to help with traffic outside of churches, synagogues, and other spaces. Um, I'd really like to know by what standards these folks are selected and by whom, um, what the racial makeup of this group is. Um, and I share Axel's concern about the killing of Trayvon Martin by a community volunteer um, who got away with it. Uh, and the most recent killing of George Floyd by trained professional police officers. And so I'm wondering whether the township county really understands the threat that a program like this poses for many of the black and brown residents of Maplewood. Um, do we know, for example, whether any of these volunteers participated in the July 5th targeting and attack on local black youth by Maplewood police? Um, I, I just, I'm really not sure why this is even a question because I think for most of us, this seems like a straightforward calculus for our leaders. The more guns there are, the increased likelihood of violence. Um, it only takes one tragedy for us to say that we wish we had done more. So I'm, asking if the township committee is open to disarming these volunteers like they do in New York City, like they do in Bloomfield and many other New Jersey jurisdictions um, and finding perhaps other ways to use coalition of peace officers in our two towns, like maybe a special mental health unit, for example, um, at a time in which people are really pushing all of us to use prisons and incarceration less as solutions to community and social problems. I think this is a really excellent opportunity for all of us to, and especially you all as our leaders to think about something new and something innovative that we can do here. Um, so I'm requesting that the township committee disarm these volunteers in their capacity as police volunteers and take the right steps to increasing the safety for everyone in our two towns, especially in these particular times. Um, and to be really clear, we're not asking that these much less experienced police volunteers get more equipment, right? We're really asking for less. Thank you, Dr. White. Um, Mary Ellen Dawkins. Hi, um, I'm at 30 Headley Place in Maplewood. Um, I'm also commenting on the disarmament of, ex of the auxiliary police. We know that um, structural racism exists in our town and especially in our police force, um, just from the, the use of force statistics. We know please stop more black people and use more force against black people in Maplewood. So why then would we allow volunteer police officers carry guns when they may perpetuate and exacerbate violence against our black youth and neighbors? 
So because of this, I really support disarming the volunteer auxiliary police. Sorry, it's hard to say this late at night. <laughs> um, my follow-up questions are also, um, uh, I, I would like to know more data on the weapon use by the auxiliary police officers. Um, does the community police board also liaise with the auxiliary police? Um, can the, the force be used effectively without weapons? Um, those are some of my questions and I hope you seriously consider disarming them. Thank you for the opportunity to give my opinion. Thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Sorry, lower hand. Oh. Okay. Uh. Lisa Carney. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, my name is Lisa Carney. I am on Highland Avenue in Maplewood. Um, I'm here to add my voice to the many requesting that Maplewood disarm the auxiliary police. Um, it's, it's very concerning and upsetting that there are people that receive a township sponsored gun and the ability to use deadly force on members of this community, <coughs> excuse me, on a volunteer basis. This practice of arming volunteers is inconsistent with most other skilled trade training programs for example, building trade apprentice programs can be four years long or 10,000 hours of work where apprentices receive training from and work under a licensed journeyman. If we expect this level of training <clears throat> before trusting our carpenters and plumbers and electrical workers and laborers in the field, it defies logic to me that our armed police are not held to the same standards or similar standards or any standards like that. Volunteer, the volunteer auxiliary police should not receive guns in our community. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Kearney. Sarah Rothman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thanks so much. I'll, I'll keep my comments brief this late. Thank you for listening. Um, this is Sarah Roth and I'm on Elmwood Avenue in Maplewood. So I wanted to add my name to the list of um, Maplewood residents who are in favor of disarming the auxiliary police. I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm curious if it's a requirement that the auxiliary police are residents of Maplewood. Um, I'm also curious if there's any um, difference in uniform, any like uh, in what they wear when they're on duty, if there's any way for a resident to know whether they're interacting with a volunteer or with a full-time officer. Um, and I would also like to um, suggest that maybe it would be to harness the enthusiasm for public well-being into a sort of mental health capacity. Maybe some of our auxiliary police could be trained if they, if we had believed they had the responsibility to handle a firearm, then surely we can believe they can be trained to help respond um, in cases when a police officer may not be needed, when some um, mental health support is really called for. So um, I wonder if we can maybe harness that resource in a non-armed capacity to still benefit the town. Um, so again, um, some of my questions have been answered already and, and several Oh, she got booted. Hold on, I'll put her back. Sorry, Sarah. All right, you're back. All right, you're back. Thanks. Um, 
thanks. I'm sorry, I was just wrapping up. I was just saying that I um, I definitely think it's it's uh, it should be the the auxiliary police should be fully disarmed. I don't think there's any question. So thank you. Thank thank you, Miss Rothman. I it was I, I heard most of it. I think um, you know I just wanted to say you know, um, that at the uh, public safety meeting, we'll, we will address uh, several of these questions uh, and have a, a deeper conversation. It's at 11 o'clock uh, tonight, we won't be having it. And there's, I think there's some, some questions we've taken notes and we also have this as recorded so we can go back. Um, but I will touch on at least two things and Mr. Lindbergh can also as well. Our auxiliary officers, if you see them on the street, they have a yellow stripe down the side of their pants that's one way you can distinguish between an auxiliary officer uh, and a Maplewood police officer. And a majority, if not all of our uh, auxiliary officers are Maplewood residents, uh, to my knowledge. Mr. Lindbergh, if you want to clarify that for me, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, on the uniforms, you know, the, the patches are different. They say Maplewood Auxiliary Police as opposed to Maplewood Police Department. Uh, the shirts are different. Uh, you know, I, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not recalling the exact differences, uh, but, you know, they're, you know, if you, Certainly, if you see an auxiliary officer next to a full-time officer, uh, you know there's there's definitely differences in the pants, in the shirt, in the patch. Um, wh whether you would recognize that from a distance, I you know I I'm not sure, uh, but certainly up close, you know if you if you met an auxiliary officer, you would see from the patch, the shirt, and the pants that it was different than than other uh, MPD officers. Uh, on the issue of uh, where the members come from. Uh, that's actually uh, regulations that come from the state police. Um, in order to be a member of the auxiliary police, the, uh, the volunteer has to come either from that town or from within five miles uh, of that town or you know, a town within five miles of that town that doesn't have its own auxiliary police force. Uh, so for our purposes, uh, my understanding is right now the only communities uh, other than Maplewood that residents can be from and join our auxiliary police would be Milburn and South Orange because those are the only communities within a five mile radius of Maplewood uh, that don't have their own auxiliary uh, police force. Thank you, Mr. Limbrick. Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to add that uh, based on what I was able to find out, we currently have 12 members uh, as reserves, and they're all Maplewood residents. And I, I, I think that number is 13 because there's the chief and then the 12 members. So that's, uh, so yeah, but I, and, and I, my understanding is that those who were from out of town uh, have either retired or, or left the force in recent years. So my understanding is the same as Deputy Mayor Daffis that while there could be members and have been in the past from surrounding communities, uh, right now, they're all Maplewood residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you both. Uh, any more? A couple more, sorry. Uh, Doreen O. Hi, my name is Doreen Oliver. Um, thank you all so much for your time. Um, I'll, I guess I'll email my address, um, but I am a Maplewood resident. Um, yeah, I am just another voice who wanted to speak uh, regarding disarming the auxiliary police. Um, again, I think it's, I, I won't repeat what everyone else has said. Um, I am in agreement. Um, and I think that along with finding out a little bit more, which some of which you've all provided tonight, um, I think what I will just add to the conversation is um, I think that we should be reducing the, the potential for for violence or harm, not just to black and brown residents or all community residents, quite honestly, but um, folks with disabilities who have been, who have, you know, there's a high rate and they're high risk of being um, harmed by police. And so that's another thing that I just wanted to mention. Uh, and I think it's, it's uh, unnecessary that these auxiliary police are armed. And, and I find it curious that they, not only are armed, but then not held with any sort of um, accountability as uh, the uh, our our full time police uh, police 
officers are in terms of body cam. So that's uh, unusual or uh, strange, I find. But again, I'm, I don't need more body cams. I just prefer that they all be disarmed. Um, and I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. David Letwin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, my name is David Letwin and I live at 17 Walnut Court in South Orange. And, and since our communities are so intertwined, I wanted to participate in this discussion. And I just have two things to say. First, I stand with the others in our community and with people of color in particular who have expressed opposition to the idea of armed auxiliary police in Maplewood and for the reasons that have already been mentioned. But beyond that, I also wanna say that we are living in an extraordinary historical moment when social structures and institutions that have been accepted as quote normal and quote inevitable are now being aggressively challenged for their complicity in longstanding systemic racism. And one of the main institutions that has come under the scrutiny led by the movement for black lives among others is the police. And the more we study the history of police departments in this country, the more we come to understand that these institutions were not created primarily to fight crime, but rather they were created so that the elites in this country could exercise social control over what they used to call the quote, dangerous classes. And in the South, where police arose out of the earlier slave patrols, that meant controlling recently emancipated black people. And in the North, it meant controlling the urban working class and the poor, mainly immigrants and, and free black folks, folks as well. And while today, almost 200 years after the first police departments were established in this country, it is true that in middle class and wealthy, which is to say largely white neighborhoods, the police also do fulfill an anti-crime role. The institution of policing in this country is still largely dedicated to keeping people of color, working class people, and the poor in line to make sure that they you know, know their place and do not threaten to upend the status quo. So wherever this discussion of auxiliary police leads, and I, I do hope it leads to their disarming, I hope it's also used as an opportunity to confront policing in our society more broadly and to join the wide ranging discussion of defunding and even abolishing policing as we now know it and of alternate ways to satisfy our understandable safety concerns. And beyond that, I hope our communities use this discussion as an opening to address the underlying causes of the crime that makes people feel like they need police in the first place, which causes are often connected to persistent systemic inequality and racism. And finally, I just wanna say that although I am a South Orange resident, I'm very pleased to hear that the committee supports removing the statue of Columbus, the, the, the plaque of Columbus. And I hope that there's a discussion about whom Maplewood might commemorate instead. And hopefully that will be somebody celebrated for her anti-racist contributions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Litwin. Thank you, sir. Jade Dean. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm Jade Dean. I live at 70 Woodland Road in Maplewood. So I'm echoing similar sentiments about disarming the police. Um, I, I still think it's important that you hear all, all of our voices and take those all into account. Um, so I, I do support there being an auxiliary force. However, I strongly oppose that the volunteers be armed. And I get that there's cost savings um, for not having to have the regular police department on traffic control or special events and the list goes on. Um, but I really think that Maplewood should be focused on ensuring that trained professionals are able to provide support and social services to the community um, rather than arming more folks with less training to police our streets. Um, so I have similar questions and would want to let know more about, you know, just really understanding why um, the volunteer force uh, currently is armed given the assignments that are typical that they typically have. Um, I want to know more about the specific training oversight and accountability. Um, and also really just trying to understand why they're currently held at a lesser standard in terms of wearing body cameras if they are armed. 
Um, and just given everything going on in the country, um, I think we need to ensure that our police force has the right training as it relates to, you know, addressing bias, uh, biases, uh, de-escalation and the use of force. And so to give so much power to volunteers to me is simply scary. Um, I have three black sons and they're young now, but the idea that one day an under-trained but armed neighbor can approach them because they seem suspicious or fit a description is, is my biggest fear. And so I think continuing to arm more folks is putting more risk on our families, putting more liability on the town. And, and I don't think that we should wait for something to happen to make changes. Thank you. Thank you, Misty. Uh, Edgar Galvis. Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, it was, uh, I'm sorry to change the conversation just a bit. I'm full support of what everyone has said about the police and the auxiliary police so far. I want to change the conversation and go back to the budget. What it was helpful to hear that a lot of hard work and deliberation was given to the 2020 budget, including pay priests across the department. It will be more helpful to hear why we're in day and specifically pay priests acted upon to further lessen the tax burden on property owners. When the Maplewood Township Committee introduced the budget for 2020, it stated that it had a 1.5 million deficit um, due to COVID and uh, other reasons. Um, at the same time, it also increased, uh, in introduced an increase in tax levy of 4%. South Orange, uh, our sister town, had a 1.8 million uh, deficit, even higher deficit, yet with uh, strategic planning and, and uh, such as pay freezes, in the departments of fire department and um, and in the police department, they were they were able to uh, have a smaller tax uh, levy on the tax on, on the property owners of two point seven percent. So I, I want to I'm really harping on that because I, I'm, I'm wondering why wasn't uh, if, if it was taken consideration, which I'm glad it was, why it wasn't acted upon to have pay freezes um, in, in, in across departments. I mean, not just the police. But across departments in general, given the unprecedented, unprecedented and uncertain times that property owners um, are going through right now. And my last question is: Is this, this still a four percent tax uh, levy increase? I know there were several modifications and and, and uh, to the budget. Uh, is this still is this still a four percent tax le uh, increase uh, levy on our property owners? Mary, you want me to handle this? Please, Mr. DeLuca. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, answer, the answer to your last question is no, the increase is uh, closer to 3%. Um, we reduced the increase by a tax point by, uh, we laid a couple people off, um, bus drivers who we weren't, you know, people who weren't working because of COVID. So we laid them off. We uh, eliminated a couple of positions and then we cut, um, somewhere around 150,000 in uh, other expenses, non-salary expenses. So we cut out $360,000 out of both the revenue stream and the expense stream, and that was out of the tax increase. So we did reduce the tax, the proposed tax increase that was uh, put forth back in May. We reduced it in the, in the uh, budget that we uh, adopted this evening. When we looked at the furloughs um, and the layoffs, it became very difficult for us to think about how we could um, lay people off, police and fire who were out. You know, we had uh, multiple people in our town, many more people in our town than in South Orange who were affected by co uh, the COVID-19 um, illness. Uh, we were transporting them, we were going to their house. Uh, we were, we were this, this is both our first responders and it, it didn't seem, appropriate for us to think about laying off people who were on the front line, people who were in um, who were essential services. And so we took the position of looking for cuts in other areas and we did reduce the budget increase by, as I said, $360,000. Um, we recognize that there is uh, some difficulty here. We, we understand completely that we're a high tax community and um, we understand that next year is going to be an equally difficult year, and um, it may come down to some other unpleasant choices. But at the moment, 
our our goal was to keep government running, and um, that meant um, maintaining our first responders, maintaining our our uh, social services department, uh, our public works department, and so it did not seem appropriate for us uh, to lay anyone off or to furlough anyone for 2020. What about pay freezes? I mean, I didn't mention anything about furlough or um, or laying anybody off. Was that so? So pay pay increases were negotiated. Uh, what South Orange did is they um, they eliminated uh, some pay increases. What the state did is they pushed out the the pay increases. We looked at that as a possibility. We looked at the state model that they had with the Communication Workers of America. Um, we we didn't we decided to keep everything in place because what was happening is as we were looking at different models we were disproportionately um, impacting people who are making lower salaries uh, and most of those people um, could ill afford to, to to not get their pay increase so um, we decided to leave everything in place uh recognizing that it's a it was a difficult year this year um and you know honestly all of our pay increases were negotiated it would have meant going back and opening up those negotiations again and um there, you have to weigh when you're doing this work you have to weigh trust factors and a relationship that goes beyond one year so if we were to go open those um those agreements again uh we we kind of figured on whether or not there would be longer term repercussions if uh, you know by doing that now and i think you saw some of that in south orange um so uh you know we had to make some judgments and we did the best we could thank you mr deluca and thank you mr galvis any more questions Stacey Thomas. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm at 25 Union Avenue. I grew up in Maplewood. I've lived here for the majority of my life with the exception of college. And um, first and foremost, I never knew that the auxiliary police existed until about maybe two months ago. Um, I think that's a problem. I do not think that they should be armed. I echo everybody's sentiments as far as that goes. Um, I also think that the fact that I would need to stand side by side with a regular police officer and an auxiliary police officer in order to be able to observe the differences in uniform is a very big problem. Um, I do not think that they should have that kind of power, especially if they are doing things as we have indicated as far as being crossing guards or back up for police at parades and that sort of thing. I think they should be visibly different to the naked eye. I should not need to be informed in order to know that they are not officially police from our town. Um, also, I would like to go back to the, um, I don't know what exactly what the ordinance is, the um, accessory dwelling ordinance. I'm very happy to hear that this is coming forth. I'm glad that, um, I agree with the, the motion to move forward with the um, age of 62. However, I would strongly encourage you as somebody who grew up here in a rental unit um, and who went on to buy the smallest house in town and then graduate from there to a larger house. Um, I think housing affordability is a huge issue. And especially when we're about to turn into an economic downturn, when people might need to subsidize their, their house or their income in any way, I, I strongly encourage you to, to consider opening that up beyond just the age of 62. Um, I think there's absolutely a way to make it so that there, you know, it doesn't become a quote unquote frat house culture. I think you can limit the amount of people who can dwell in a dwelling or an accessory dwelling, you know, maybe no more than two people, whatever you need to do in order to, to meet that end. But, um, but yeah. That, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And please, please, please reconsider um, our auxiliary police in the way that they're reusing them. And um, if we can in any way employ them or somebody else to meet the need as far as social services and mental health issues and answer other calls that don't need armed police, I, I fully encourage that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Uh, thank you very much, actually. And, you know, I just want to just on your second comment about the ordinance, as we mentioned in the discussion, we, you know, it's, it's a phase approach. So we will definitely take a look at um, future um, uh, ordinances or, or, or continue that conversation uh, that you have mentioned this evening. So, um, Glenn, do we have any more uh, public comments? Okay. No, we're done. All right. Uh, Hearing and seeing none, I uh, will now entertain a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Adjourn. I move. Motion. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. That was awesome. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.